It's a new dawn. It's a new day. It's a new year. But it's the same old boys hosting your favorite horror movie review podcast in this multiverse and the next. Why, it's dead and lovely. Here with the host with the most, it's me, your good buddy, Uncle Ben. You are every podcast in the world to Aww, me. That's our song. Yeah. Hey, it's me, Hollywood Steve. <laughs> and we are here to just kick off 2021 with a raging good time by smashing some co beers, mm -hmm. recounting our holiday seasons, talking about the best flicks of 2020. Also, we're going to be recounting the votes. They sent oh, yeah, them yeah. to us, all mm -hmm. the votes. They said, yeah. you guys just make sure we got it right. So Yeah, they knew they had to call in the best, right? so of course they hit us up. <laughs> We're going to be back here being like, one vote for me to count, a two for me to count. <laughs> Guys, we need this done quickly. <laughs> yeah. Stop making <laughs> need to jokes. Hurry up a little bit. <laughs> you don't have to laugh after every number. Fuck. <laughs> and of course, we're also going to be reviewing Slither from 2006. If you just want to find out if you should watch that movie and you're looking for a review, well, for one, yeah, it's yeah, great. Watch, watch it. the movie. It's great. But if you if you just want to hear us chin wag about that, there's a timestamp for mm -hmm. you Check her out. in the podcast description. If you think you're too good to hang out with us. But you know what, Steve? I just got to find out how your Christmas season went. We're recording this December 29th. This is our first yeah. post-Christmas episode. I'm sure that you spent that thing just holiday raging Dude. and uh, doing all the festive things and togetherness, right? We had us a little snow come in on, sure uh, did. on December 24th. And... Um, it was, uh, it was, uh, I had just gone to the store and it had just started and I looked at the weather and saw, oh, it's going to be snowing a whole bunch and it's going to be icy. So I woke Emily up like two, three hours before she had to be at work. And I was like, Hey, here's the situation. And she was like, all right, I'm gonna have to go to work and I'm just going to pack a bag. Cause I assume I'm going to have to stay there. Yeah. Cause something y'all might not know. Whenever the roads get icy in East Tennessee, you're fucked. You aren't driving on them. They're they're laid out like damn spaghetti, and they're not taken care of. So when we get ice, you don't drive on it. Yeah, like you know the main roads, uh, they they salted pretty quickly. But we we live uh, at an intersection that's at the bottom of a hill, so tons of cars wreck every time. Oh yeah, it snows here. There were two cars in our driveway um for a couple days because of the snow well and plus everybody's got to do their traditional holiday drunk driving <laughs> yeah okay so by the way <laughs> when i was at the store um I, I as i was leaving and i was like fuck it is it is bad i saw a guy who was very obviously drunk drop a ginger ale and then he was like talking and i was like oh good there's somebody in there who's driving and then i i noticed no he's just talking to himself and he's about to drive in the snow. <laughs> Hooray. Anyway. So he's using that ginger ale to mix that up with all the whiskey that was exactly. already in his tummy. <laughs> right. So so I spent uh the entirety of uh the twenty fourth and twenty fifth uh alone with my dog. And then Ben, the twenty fifth, I you know, it was a Friday, we were gonna do the screaming chat. Let me preface this with, for the past three weeks, I have barely slept more than four hours at a time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Don't know what's going on. Think it has to do with the seasons and just how little light we've, we've had or whatever, but I've just... I mean, there ain't nothing to worry about in the country or nothing, so I don't, I don't think <laughs> right, you have anything on your mind at all. all of that. Uh, so, Friday, uh, it was a few hours before the screaming chat and I was like, man, I, I gotta take a nap. Uh, that nap turned into me sleeping uh, eight full hours for the first time in a long time. Hey! But also sleeping entirely through the screaming chat. <laughs> Dude, are you settling in for a long winter's nap? <laughs> yeah, so that, Damn it. that sucked because that would have been some human interaction on Christmas. Instead, it was just 
I woke up way too late and uh, watched Christmas movies by myself. Woo! Woo! <laughs> <laughs> that sounds kind of lame. I mean, after that, you and uh, you and your wife had a little time off together and stuff, though, right? Did you get a little late celebration in? We did. We got to celebrate, and that, that was good. It, uh, it definitely improved. I made a cinnamon roll cheesecake for Woo-hoo-hoo. my wife. Damn. And god damn, let me tell you, Ben, I will never make that again because it is it is a tragic sin. It is so good. Just sh- so much sugar though. Oh yeah. So much. It was amazing mm-hmm. though. It it uh you basically make cinnamon roll filling and oh my god. Uh, you drop a, a quarter of the cinnamon roll filling in the the par baked crust then like a third of the cheesecake, then mm, another quarter mm. of the cinnamon roll, third of the cheesecake, oh, God. another slow, quarter. Slow down, a little third. slower, a little slower. And then little you top slower. it off Ooh. with the last bit, and that bit mm. on the top gets like nice and glassy, like the, the sugar just gets so perfectly like crystallized Ooh, that you get this nice crunch on the outside, but then on the inside just all the cinnamony goodness. Ugh. Holy moly. I, I can't lie to you, man. I'm about at half mast right now. Yeah. I'm at least al dente <laughs> based on that description. I'm not gonna lie. It, it was very, very good. And yeah, yeah, we hung out and we watched. Uh, uh, Emily finally got to watch uh, the Mandalorian, and and we started Big Mouth season four. So we had fun, but th- those two days were a little bleak. <laughs> yeah, I would say so. I am totally ready to restart the Mandalorian. By the way, I just want to oh, watch the so whole thing good. again. Yeah. Oh, so so you were satisfied with the uh, second season and stuff? Oh man, yeah, yeah. I, we talked about it last week, but uh, it, yeah, it's it's the best. I really like watching through it again. I was like, yeah, this is what Star Wars should be. It's so fun. It uh, pays fan service while also like introducing expanding the universe. Yeah, yeah, introducing more and expanding the universe. And yeah, I really love the the dark troopers like robot mm-hmm, yeah oh my gosh those were awesome so cool so cool man well i'm sorry that you had yourself kind of a eh, kind of a shit christmas there man i mean you know that that does blow it we does. had kind of a an unusual christmas but we had a really really great time um you know typically typically christmas is spent with family and stuff huge family meals and all that jazz and traveling to and fro to different places and delivering gifts, just all the usual, Mm -hmm. you know, uh, kind of stuff that you think about there. But that was not an option this year. And so we decided that we were just going to spend Christmas Eve and Christmas Day just here uh, at the apartment, just my wife and I and the dog. And uh, we had already done like present drops with family and stuff like the week before, just dropping presents off on people's doorsteps and stuff, which was kind of fun playing Santa, honestly. Oh, yeah. You know, just doing a little doorstep drop and stuff. It was actually kind of neat, kind of Christmassy, honestly. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, you know, this year we we're just like, we're just going to stay in. We're going to have ourselves our own feast. We did a, a prime rib for the first time. Ooh. Dude, I am telling you. It was absolutely incredible. We got the meat from Hen Hawk Butcher Shop in the old city. And I was really worried that we were going to like screw it up because that's an expensive piece of meat and we'd never done one before. But dude, this cooking method. Did I tell you about how we cooked it? Yes. Oh, you told me, but uh, we didn't talk about it on the podcast. Word, dude. It, it's crazy and it worked perfectly. I owe all the glory to, to Chef John over on Food Wishes on YouTube because it was his method. And... It was wild. It worked perfectly. Watch his whole video on it. Just look up Food Wishes Prime Rib. But I can't imagine when I'll make a prime rib, but I want to. <laughs> so. Dude, yeah, if you do, you do it with this method because every single piece was perfectly medium rare, even the end pieces. It was nuts. And all you got to do is like a little bit of math to figure out exactly the minutes per weight kind of thing. Yeah. And you stick it in a 500 degree oven for exactly that time period. And then you just cut the oven off for two hours. You don't open it. You don't do anything. You just leave it in there for two hours and let the heat coast down. And it was literally perfect. It was unreal. Oh, and then you get prime rib sandwiches and stuff for the leftovers. Yeah. So good, man. So fucking good. So we had ourselves a fantastic feast. We opened some presents with family and stuff over Zoom. Oh, and it was cool. the kind of thing, you know, where it's like, it was it was weird, but we, we all made the best of it and had a good time. And frankly, like, it was really nice not having to drive all over creation. 
I bet. You know? Yeah. We usually, you know, there's some years where we end up having like five Christmases oh, <laughs> in two wow. days. And it's just like, my God. Like, so sometimes by the end of it, it's just like, how much time have we spent in the car, just like sleepily driving uh, from place to place yeah. and watching the clock and not really getting to hang out anywhere as long as we want because we got to be at the next one and stuff. So, you know, although we missed family and stuff, obviously, um, it was nice to have just a fun, cozy one here at home, yeah. making our own food and seeing family and stuff over the web, over the worldwide internet that Al Gore bestowed upon us. We were using Thank his you, gift to us. Thank you, Al Gore, <laughs> as always. Did everyone leave out a plate of cookies for Al Gore this year? <laughs> That's what you got to do, right? Uh-huh. <laughs> so, yeah, it was uh, it was cool, man. And then the day of Christmas, we just kind of spent it, like, watching Return of the King and just hanging out and having a couple different Zoom calls with family and stuff. And it was great. Watching that Return of the King, I'll tell you what, that'll take up a day, and it's going to be a great day. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Yeah, I did it. Uh, recently before our two towers episode and yeah it's it's oh, yeah. just so awesome fucking amazing i watched someone return on christmas as well you don't say but it was it was batman you watched batman return yeah i watched batman <gasps> return and uh when he did there was a cat woman and there was a penguin a cat woman mm-hmm. oh my gosh was it a danny devitz a danny devitz man i'll <laughs> tell you what one Batman Returns has enough horror elements that we'll just cover it on the show. I think that sounds like a I wonderful idea. I don't even think idea. it's a wild card. I think we'll just Mm-mm. do it some December. I think it sounds like a great idea. Two, it's probably the best Batman. It might be. I mean, I love the OG. Like, the OG is, yeah, of course, absolutely it's legendary. Great. Yeah, and the Nolan films are good. I'm not, mm-hmm. you know... Uh, I, I think... I think I thought the Nolan films were better than they were in when yeah. they were coming out. Me too. I, and I've watched Dark Knight a lot because Heath Ledger is legit good in it, but oh, yeah. oh it's got some flaws. <laughs> it's got, got some, some problems. problems. <laughs> it really, really does, man. Honestly, of all the Nolan ones, I think Begins is still probably my favorite. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. I, but, you know, love an origin story and stuff, so that's typical. Yeah, I am, uh, yeah, I am pretty positive that batman returns is my favorite and and the best and michelle pfeiffer (laughs) amazing just so good oh yeah oh yeah absolutely awesome man and yeah devito as the penguin is just disgusting he's so gross (laughs) it's the best he's ever been i mean yeah like he's he's great we all love danny devito but like it's the the most in a role he's ever been and he's just like gross and demented and exactly what you want penguin to be yeah isn't it so weird that like whenever that movie came out there's like a huge mcdonald's like franchising marketing thing that they did with that with like happy meal toys and stuff and you're like Uh uh-huh it features like a four foot tall danny devito (laughs) who bites a guy's nose off and has black ooze coming out of his mouth and also, it's like, or you can get this woman in just an out-and-out bondage yeah. costume with your Happy Meal. <laughs> or Batman. Or Batman, yeah. Isn't that a little weird? <laughs> that is very strange, for sure. I Yeah, mm-hmm. I, it was, uh, I mean, that was that was kind of the end of Tim Burton's run on Batman, right? Like, because they, they, people did have issues with it. It really yeah. wasn't aimed at kids at all. <laughs> No, and I feel like that sort of uh, approach and outlook would be a lot more appreciated today, and it would get, oh, yeah. you know, he'd get more swings at it, I think. Oh, sure, yeah. That, yeah. But knowing Tim Burton, too, I bet he was kind of tired of it by two movies. Absolutely, and he he just gets to do whatever he wants to do now, so, like, I wouldn't mind, though, seeing him come back uh, to direct a, another comic book movie. Yeah, he, yeah. He's, uh, you know, anything he does, it's going to it's they're gonna have to just let him do whatever he wants but like there's tons of comic book ips that he could he could really nail of course yeah man you know a lot of his more recent movies haven't been great i wasn't Mm -mm. a big fan of that uh the remake of that 50s uh soap opera with all the (laughs) werewolves and vampires oh yeah yeah yeah. i never saw that i know the one you're talking about though it looked like it was really bad. I haven't bad. seen Big Eyes either. Big Eyes is okay. Is 
Yeah. Yeah, it's all right. Like not one of those ones I'm like really jonesing to watch again anytime soon. But you know, I would definitely be on board with DC asking any talented writers and directors for help. Dude, I think they should just ask for DC, help. DC, oh, we'll, we're gonna talk about Wonder Woman in a second. I've got like serious some advice for DC. Margot Robbie is the anchor of the DC cinematic universe. Yes, and she's getting it, dude. You need to forget about Superman and Batman and these 1930s comic book characters that aren't as popular today with the kids. Yeah, totally. And recognize that Teen Titans and Young Justice have nailed a lot of characters that kids would be interested in seeing. They dude, love Suicide Squad. They love Harley Quinn. Just go that way. Yeah, don't feel obligated to be like, we have to use all of our biggest name properties. Those no, are yeah. our flagship lines. Dude, it's like you said, go into a middle school or a high school, grab any kid and say, who's your favorite DC yeah. character? They're not going to say fucking Superman. It's like, dude, we get it. Superman is very, very important in the world of comic book history, but that fucking character just doesn't connect anymore. It's been no. done. It's been done to fucking death. Yes, Try absolutely. leaning on those other properties. Like, dude, Teen Titans and, like, all that stuff is enormously popular. Why yeah. aren't they milking that? It's right there. It, yeah, it's ridiculous. It And it... I, I just... I see so much... It feels so cynical whenever you watch a DC movie to me. Like, it feels like they're, they're not as dedicated to the characters as the MCU is. Like, mm -hmm. they, they don't... Spoilers for Wonder Woman 1984. If you'll want to avoid them, skip forward to 32 minutes and 26 seconds. Like, uh, I don't want to go in too much detail with Wonder Woman, but I definitely do want to talk about some of the major problems with, with Wonder Woman. Uh, and one of those yeah. major problems is a problem that's a carryover from the first movie. The movies aren't about her, they're about Steve Trevor. Yeah, what the fuck? Yeah. Why the fuck? Yeah. Yeah, you know everybody's favorite comic book character? Steve Trevor. <laughs> the guy with two white guy first names. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, not too much of a spoiler, but uh, we'll we'll put a spoiler warning in, in the, the episode description so you can skip ahead when we're done with this, but the invisible jet is in Wonder Woman. Yeah. She doesn't fly it. No. It's uh -uh. her fucking invisible jet, right? Yes. She never and flies it. She doesn't fly it. Although it can be flown by a completely average man. Yeah. Who didn't recognize what a trash can was in 1984 right. earlier in the movie. Yeah. But he can definitely fly a fucking jet. Did you also love the part where she learned how to fly because she remembered the words of a man teaching her how to fly? Yeah. Steve, like, this is the thing that we just got to put out here right at the front of this. Because I know you're listening, you know, if you're listening to the show, you're like, oh, big shocker. Two guys didn't like Wonder Woman. We, di we didn't like this movie because it's not feminist enough. Yeah, it's not. Yeah, we didn't like, we didn't dislike this movie because it's centered on a woman. We dislike no. this movie because it's not. Because it's, it's not at all. It's about Wonder Woman. Why is it not centered on her? It's like... I don't, I don't get it, man. I don't get it at fucking all. Like, I don't understand people's critiques with this movie where, like, you do see a bunch of just dumbass fucking piece of shit incel morons yeah. on the internet that are like, it's about girls. It's not good. It's, right. It's feminist, woke bullshit. Like, I've seen so many people talking about how this movie is so woke, blah, <laughs> yeah. blah, blah. And I'm like... What the fuck no, movie did you this watch? Movie this sleep. This movie's is not asleep. Woke. This thing is sleeping. <laughs> no, dude. Yeah, I, I so I don't get that complaint, and yeah. I don't agree with it whatsoever. It needed a lot more feminism brought into it. Dude, you're talking about a woman who's a fucking literal Greek goddess, okay? Yes. And she 
spends apparently 60 years, the time span from the first movie to 1984, uh-huh. pawning over her completely Joe Average quasi-boyfriend that she knew for like four days 60 years ago. Yep. She can't fucking get over him? It's all Are she thinks kidding? about. It's like everything in her office is some How's reminder of him. How is that feminist? Like yeah. there's nothing about that that is like, oh man, they're really breaking my balls with this movie. Yeah. No. It's... It's silly. The thing is that it should be focused on the relationship between Wonder Woman and Cheetah. Yeah. Because that's the strongest point. And in in the comics, like their relationship is is very intense and it it could have gone into that. It could have been stronger in that area, but instead of doing that, Cheetah's not really the villain. It's Pedro Pascal. And hey, but I'll tell you what, you got to <laughs> at least appreciate the super original angle they went with, with Kristen Wiig and Cheetah, the angle of, hey, super hot, tall, skinny woman that doesn't realize that she's attractive because she's mousy and wears glasses and has right. no confidence for literally no reason. Maybe if she just put on some eyeliner and lost the glasses, what do you know? She's suddenly hot. Right. God damn. Like, why are we still doing that story? I don't know. I mean, but it was in Batman Returns, the best Batman movie. So, eh. yeah. <laughs> but yeah. But it's, it's like, it was it's also been so Poison many. Ivy. Yeah. It was also, yeah. um, was it Jamie Foxx in yes. Spider Man where he's uh-huh. like, I'm a nerd? Blah, it's blah, also blah. in Iron Man uh, 3 yeah. with Guy Pierce. Uh, yeah. It's, yeah, it's, it's a overused trope. It would make just as much sense if she was a confident woman who saw another confident woman's power and wanted it. That would make more sense. Yep. <laughs> it would be just as interesting. And if again, if the entire thing was focused on them and her, like Wonder Woman trying to stop Cheetah. But it is not that. It is no. focused on the power of wishes and uh, uh, hopes and dreams. There's also just the the really wonderful notion that <laughs> at the end of the first movie, she beat a literal Greek god of war. Right. That was the bad guy. The mm-hmm. bad guy in this one is a rock. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the bad guy is yeah. a rock. He's a a rock. non-sentient being. He's a, he's a, wish, a wishing rock. Yeah. And again, I guess at the end of the movie, the entire message is... The world would be better if you just kind of gave up on your dreams. Yeah, yeah. The the, <laughs> the final the message, message is really like, like seriously anti-feminist because like what Cheetah learns is that she should not embrace her power and rage. She should just accept the world for what it is and that she is powerless. Yeah, that's just kind of the the message at the end of the movie. <laughs> yeah, it's shit. What in the fuck? It's, it's really it's fucking shitty. <laughs> it's really, really, really bad, man. I I absolutely don't understand it. And there's just so many logic holes and shit in there, dude. It's like, yeah. okay, Pedro Pascal is like, I wish there was a gigantic wall here in the Middle East. Boom, wall just materializes. There's like cars stranded on top of it and shit. Yeah. Whereas everything else like plays out in like they'll he'll be like oh i need employees and then people will walk in like i was trying to go here or whatever it's like okay i that can make sense a wall just suddenly appearing doesn't make sense if people just suddenly started building a wall it would have made sense because it seems to have influence over people not reality itself well but then also too it's like wonder woman in in all of her amazing powers is like i wish i had a boyfriend which is God damn, so fucking stupid. And what ends up happening is that she doesn't just have Steve materialize in front of her as the magic rock could have done. He has to, like, possess the body of some guy whose life, I guess, just gets put on hold for a while. Like, that guy's getting fired from his job. Like, what if he's not feeding his pets at home? Like, there's a lot of bad stuff that happened because this guy just got possessed by white guy, white guy. I mean... (laughs) The re- one of my major problems starts at the very beginning. Uh, well, not the very beginning, because the very beginning is all the stuff in Themyscira. But w- the bit when we're back in, or when we get to 1984, Wonder Woman, who has the powers of a goddess, who is mm-hmm. on par with Superman. Yeah. She's stopping a robbery of a jewelry store in a mall and 
the thing they're robbing are black market goods. So yeah. the jewelry store was committing a crime. She is not interested in that crime. <laughs> she is interested in right, the crime yeah. of that jewelry store getting robbed. So she is only dealing with petty shit. Like teenage yeah. Spider-Man level shit. She's a <laughs> goddess. What in the fuck? <laughs> she should be like stopping missiles and shit. But no, yeah, she's yeah. at a mall. <laughs> because we want to show you remember 1984 they had malls <laughs> remember people are into the 80s right stranger things right right uh -huh. yeah so we should do that that's the whole reason it's set in 84 that is the only other reason because it makes no sense otherwise no and also it's in 1984 but as someone in like our our group and stuff pointed out there's not even any 80s music in it there's no, no. like <laughs> give me that big synthesizers yep. and fucking Lynn drums and stuff. There's no fun with it being in the 80s other than there's some people in tracksuits at the first of the movie. Right. And they also use Dumb. all of the color on the posters and none in the movie. Like, Dude, for real. <laughs> the posters were like this crazy Technicolor 80s neon yeah, thing. Yeah, and it was like, oh, that looks rad. Yeah. Not in, the, in movie, the movie, though. None of it. The thing that's so fucked up about that soundtrack thing, too, when you think about it, is how absolutely ham-fisted dc usually is with the way that they handle soundtrack just shoving soundtrack down your throat with licensed music like in suicide squad and stuff yeah. and in this one they're just like maybe none <laughs> it's like what the fuck is the matter with you guys yeah they cannot get this right man no they can't and it's but the thing is it it a lot of people like it and yeah, I'm seeing some people that yeah. are enjoying it, and I'm glad they are. I'm I mean, glad they I hate are. if they used all this yeah. money, which could have been spent on fixing fucking Flint, Michigan's water or sure. literally anything, anything. else. Right. I'm uh, glad it's not going to nothing, and some people are liking it, I guess. And they, they're already announced a, a third one will come out, and they said it will end the trilogy. Apparently, they have decided that it, it was always going to be a trilogy. I love, I love when Hollywood does that, when they just outright lie to you. And it's like, yeah, totally. that's like the dumbest <laughs> lie. Way. Why? Yeah. <laughs> well, you don't have to say that. Never had to say that. Maybe third time's the charm. I mean, the, the first one, I'm okay with the first half of the first one. And then when it gets really boyfriendy, it's just kind of, yeah, the, it really loses its charm there. I, I mean, the first one is, is in so many ways, just a copy of the first Captain America movie, oh, yeah. but set in World War One, and too much focused on the male characters. And again, not focused enough on a goddess yeah <laughs> she's fucking wonder woman Ugh, it's just ridiculous but yeah it, it's it did have some really cool bits the the first fight between her and cheetah in the white house is awesome yeah that's cool yeah like th there was some good and that's why i say it should have been focused on her and cheetah the whole time that should have been the movie Oh, yeah. And then the last fight with her fighting Rumple Teaser from Cats is <laughs> less cool. Like, Way a less lot cool. less cool. Way less like, cool. Infinitely less cool. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, and I'll tell you what, too, man. Like, you're telling me whenever it's showing us all these scenes where it's, like, showing all these people around the world that get their wishes. Oh, they get their wishes because the energy of the satellite feed is, quote, touching them. Yeah, fucking sure. Uh, yeah. It's showing all the wishes that people got and stuff. Okay, for one, you're telling me that not one person was just like, I wish the entire Earth would explode right now. Fuck the world. Like, that absolutely would have happened. And absolutely. also, you're telling me there wasn't one guy they're going to show with two chicks at the same time. Come on. Oh, absolutely. That would be like 50% of dudes, right? Two <laughs> chicks at the same time, man. At the same time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just completely ridiculous, man. They they absolutely blew it. Like, I want it to be good. I want there to be people watching female-led superhero movies and being like, oh, what do you know? These are still amazing. Just because it doesn't yeah. have a dude as the main character doesn't mean I can't like it. We both talked about how, how much uh, we liked Captain Marvel on the rewatch. Like, it's a good, solid movie. Uh, I positive that black widow we will be good because i've really loved scarlett johansson as black widow and it, oh yeah i'm excited for yeah. that so like uh you know it's oh and also birds of prey i i liked birds of prey it wasn't great like the story structure was a little off but it was trying to mimic like how harley's mind works which is basically mm -hmm. like she's all over the place 
Yeah. Uh, it, uh, I enjoyed it because Margot Robbie, I as I said, is the anchor of the DC Cinematic Universe. She is it like she's the solid part that they need to build around and i mean i think uh james gunn who directed slither his suicide squad looks like it might be a good direction for them to go in like if they if it succeeds and it it looks good i i think this might be the the reversal for them like if they can just lean that way yeah i think so man because the way that it feels right now like if you watch Aquaman or Justice League oh, or Aquaman Batman Superman so bad, or yeah. any oh it's so bad like Wonder Woman is still the best of them I guess yeah. like it absolutely Wonder Woman and I would still say 1984 is better than any of the others to me uh I mean Justice League's okay Batman versus Superman maybe maybe Batman versus Superman is my number two but they're all just not great no, they yeah. all feel like some Hollywood. Oh, exec I was forgetting who... Birds of Prey. There, I would say Birds of Prey would be number two then for me. Oh, actually. okay, yeah. that makes sense. Yeah, but they all kind of feel to me like just some you know Hollywood exec read the back of the boxes for like Iron Man and right. Avengers and stuff. They read the back of the box and they're like, oh, I get it, I could do that. You got yeah, whatever. Yeah. There's people flying around, they fight a bad guy, eh, whatever. And what? Let's make this movie. Yeah. <laughs> like, but didn't actually watch the movies or read the comic books or use anything that was sitting right yeah. in front of them, man. Yeah. It's, God, dude. It's a sad state of affairs. Yeah, it is. It is. And like <laughs> I said, it really, I think, is extra upsetting because – you know, the one claim that the DCU had this entire time is that they actually got to female-fronted hero right. movie before Marvel. Yeah. Like, they managed to do that before fucking Marvel, and that's great, and the world needs that, and then they just fumbled the fucking ball. Yep. And, you know, maybe they could pick it back up on the third one. Uh, I, I think, you know, definitely the pandemic probably had some to play on the post-production and, and and stuff but you know other movies other movies have come out that haven't had those problems so that's true but i was doing a little bit of reading about it and as far as like the post-production and stuff goes there's apparently i think like seven different release dates that they had for this yeah yeah the first one going all the way back to 2019 and yeah. they're like yeah push it back yeah push it back yeah push it uh, let's yeah. make it come out of christmas <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. Uh, Maybe they weren't confident in it, and that's why I shouldn't have been. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, yeah, Uh, yeah. Let's move on from Wonder Woman, though. That uh, I, I think we extensively covered that. Uh, What else you been watching, Ben? Well, I'll tell you one female-fronted joint that I watched that was fucking fantastic: uh, The Queen's Gambit. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. I turned into the Kool-Aid man there for a second. (laughs) (laughs) Dude, it was seriously fucking fantastic. We started it the other day and blew through it. It was just like, you know, we had plans on watching some other movies and stuff, and it was just like, do you just kind of want to keep going on Queen's Gambit? Yes. I was hoping that you'd say that because it really is fantastic. And uh, Anna Joy Taylor, our homegirl from The Witch and uh, Split and stuff, I think that she's fucking amazing, and she knocked it out of the park with this it is fascinating and i'll tell you man like i've never really had anything make me like get pumped up about chess and want to play (laughs) chess (laughs) but this somehow did it so yeah i think that you'd really really like it so i hope you get a a chance to check it out sometime and see you think about it i think the only other really noteworthy thing that we watched is a, uh, a christmas tradition around here we watched the muppet family christmas which is like a 45 minute thing you can find it on youtube it's actually not on Disney Plus or anything. Hmm. You can find rips of it on YouTube. Have you ever watched it? Yeah, of course. It's a classic. It's classic. fantastic. But mm-hmm. but I did have some observations this time around that I was thinking about. For one, the count. We already talked about the count <laughs> once in this episode. I think he's like super OCD and I worry about it sometimes. I worry that he's like, <laughs> I have to count turning this light switch on five times or else we will all die. One, <laughs> two. <laughs> you know, like he's probably like counting ceiling tiles and stuff like this. Like it probably really gets in the way of his life because he, he truly has no control over his compulsion just to count everything. Do you know, that's very interesting because something I've been watching this week has a character who has that compulsion and counts things. Fargo season four. Oh, yeah, a little counting going on in that Yeah, scene? there's a detective in there who reminds me of the detective from uh, Frighteners. 
kind of but with less of the weird creepy well he's got a weird vibe but less of the creepy vibe <laughs> okay but um yeah fargo season four is so good uh chris rock awesome in it Ooh. it is man it, it's uh i mean every season of fargo has been so good that's that, what you say yeah that i i cannot i like i don't know how that noah holly is doing it <laughs> like how he did it and uh, how he's doing it how he did legion like how how in the world this man is so capable at fleshing out these characters and these worlds and making it s like fit the coen brothers aesthetic nice man yeah I've, I've heard so many times that i need to watch it and for some reason i just haven't listened to these people telling me i gotta go watch the fargo dude i'm telling you the moment you start the first episode you're just gonna be happy that you have four seasons to watch nice yeah, that's the nice thing now is like i've got a little backlog yeah on that's end, awesome so. yeah <laughs> i think the other observation that i had about muppet family christmas too is you know there's that part in there where uh one of my favorite muppets the swedish chef He's all stoked about his, uh, his his dinner, his turkey dinner he's making for everyone. And then he gets a look at Big Bird and is like, holy shit, <laughs> yeah. I got to cook this bird. <laughs> Can you imagine the version of the movie where he actually does <laughs> yes. murder, murder Big Bird, just cut Big Bird's head off, stuff him, roast him, <laughs> and then like serve him to his own friends and family? Orgy, no, like, that was our friend. <laughs> oh my god! What have you done, you monster? Orgy, 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 orgy. <laughs> and he's just laughing maniacally in Swedish. <laughs> I mean, it would get really, really dark. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it would. Yeah. So I watched two other movies that were in relation to Slither. So okay, I'm going to talk about them a little here, but I'm going to talk about them a lot more when we actually get to the movie. I watched Night of the Creeps because oh yeah, classic Slither is often compared to it for you know good reason the yeah. the slug alien part. Mm -hmm. Um, but uh, I didn't see a ton of other correlations. But Night of the Creeps is still fucking awesome. Oh yeah, that's a silly one. I can't believe we've not done that on the show. I know. Yeah, we got to do it. We got to do it sometime because it is this movie is definitely in a, a genre, but. The 80s had a ton of these movies that started in space with something yep. falling from space to Earth. And that's oh, where yeah. the horror starts. Tons. Killer Clowns, Predator. Yeah. Yeah. All sorts of movies. Uh, and it's also, I mean, it's it's coming from the 50s movies that, that all did that. But it's, it's, um, it's interesting how many of them actually start that way. The thing starts in space with something falling from the sky mm -hmm. like it's all critters critters yeah there's so many like i uh, i wonder why i hmm. just wonder why that at that time particularly they that was such a trope anyway yeah i watched another movie though that uh you had recommended a while ago and uh i don't know why i put it off for so long brightburn Oh yeah, dude. Oh yeah, man. I'm I'm curious to see what you thought about this one because I thought that it was fucking cool. I know a lot of people that didn't get into it at all, uh, partially because it's so dark and so bleak. It's very dark. I thought it was really cool. Did you dude, like it? I loved it, and I yeah. I really hope they make a sequel and expand the world the way they Me too. you know the that post credit or mid credit scene seemed to indicate. Mm -hmm. uh, I would love to find out about that. Uh, 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 nun or whatever who chokes people and all the other characters they were mentioning i thought that oh, yeah. it, it was man here's the thing it's basically slither like elizabeth mm. banks in it is the same yeah. character and does almost the same exact stuff i guess so yeah <laughs> I, well, I watched way, them yeah. like you know i had watched brightburn and then i turned on slither and i was like what the this is crazy because James Gunn is the producer mm -hmm. and, and like it like so much of it is similar. Like it basically the uh, uh, inciting incident is uh, a thing falling from space in the woods. The the way uh, Elizabeth Banks, character, uh, honestly, every single scene in Slither, uh, aside from the scenes with the husband abuse is replicated like 
her being cagey with the cops, her hmm. like trying hiding something to stab the the villain with in the end. Oh yeah, like that does happen in that. There just so much of it is like what the heck? Yeah, and it plays so many of the same beats. So uh, yeah, Brightburn's great, and hope they do sequels and would love to see more of it. I mean, it it was a low budget movie that that made money. So I thought that it was really really underrated and it was also just cool seeing something that bleak and that fucking nihilistic yeah. during kind of the heyday of like the marvel craze too yeah agree <laughs> I'll, I'll drink a code beer to that one you want to oh yeah let's drink us a code beer let's get a code one right here now i've got myself some i ain't never had they yeah, haven't had this either I, I picked up a sierra nevada dankful ipa Ooh, that sounds lovely. I don't think I've had that either, but I do love some Sierra Nevadas, man. Yeah, they got a, they got Sierra Nevada is stuck to that sort of piney, resiny taste, and I I I dig it. Oh yeah, when it quits being good, I'll quit drinking it. Uh huh. I've got myself a beer called Ditto from Bearded Iris, just over there in Nashville, just across the way in Nashville, and uh, this is a double IPA. That says Styrian Wolf 630 hops. I guess there's a hop varieties. And then it also says strawberry and mango. So I'm guessing this is kind of a creamy milkshakey sort of a funky fruity IPA. We'll find out about it. It's 8.2%. It's Holy strong. Damn. They put alcohol in here. Mine just says generously hoppy, and it's a 7.4%er. So mm, yeah, that'll get it done too. The smell coming off of this is uh is dank it, it smells oh, yeah? very hoppy just from this smells very strawberry -y. like lots of strawberry coming off of this thing more than i thought that it'd be it seems like that's not going to be a subtle component let's just dip our whiskers in and see what we think about these things How, how's that treat you steve it is hoppy as hell mm. it's got that like you know like the sides of your tongue sort of like oh yeah just pucker in a little bit it's good though, not not like overly piney. It's uh, it tastes like, it tastes like hops, but not in a, a terribly bitter way. Mmm, I like that already. Yeah, I'm sure I would enjoy that one. They make a couple other ones like that, Hop Bullet, and mm -hmm. a couple others that I really torpedo. like a lot too. Yeah, Torpedo is really good too. This is okay. No, oh. I'm not actually all that nuts about this. This might be my least favorite thing I've had from, uh, from Bearded Iris. Oh, it's man. uh. Yeah, it's like quite sweet and quite strawberry y. Like it almost tastes like if you had a funky hoppy beer and you put like a tablespoon of like strawberry syrup in it. Like you Ooh. know, like the Hershey's like strawberry yeah. milk stuff. It's kinda like that. It's not really very good, honestly. So it you would not call it a funky cold Medina. No, I wouldn't. I would definitely not give it that title, that badge that of honor. Is that a positive? I never <laughs> could figure that out. That's a good question. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I actually don't think I'll drink all this. Like, if I'm going to have a big old calorie bomb of a beer, yeah, it I want be them good. calories to be good, you know? So I actually might reach for a backup here because I, I don't see myself drinking all this. So I might have to take myself a little drink break at some point in this podcast. Maybe I'll drink a few more sips and I'll warm up to it, but... Yeah, I might just have to take myself a little detour and get myself something else to pull on. I want the first pull of the new year to be a good pull. You know what I mean? That's true. You don't you don't want to get a bad pull at the beginning of the year. You know what they mm -hmm. say? First pull of the year that sets the tone for every sets pull tone, after. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You're damn right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> break, break, breaker. I got a call for a beer backup right here. What do you got there for me, Big Steve? I got myself a high wire backup beer good thing i travel with a backup i've got myself a hazy and juicy and hoppy and fresh this is their double ipa double dry hopped new england style ipa it apparently features strata waimea enigma and idaho seven hops this has got all kinds of things in here steve where they where they fit all this stuff um hmm let me see if you put it all together did they put it in like a can or a bottle? It's in a big old pint can. Okay, that's where they fit it. Yep. It's in there. It's in there, yep. <laughs> they put it in the beer cells. Uh -huh. I like a high wire. They make some pretty good stuff. Me I'm too, not going to yeah. say that they're like a knock it out of the park, everything they do is amazing place. Mm. 
but everything that I've had from there has been solid, and I, I like some of their um, like pale ales and lagers and stuff like that. Yeah, their fine. mosaic IPA is really good. Oh, that one actually is really good. I forgot about yeah. that thing. It smells pretty nice. It's got a good cloudy appearance. Nice little frothy head on top of it. Let's just let's just get my goatee in this thing and see what it does to me. What do you think? Does it taste like a beer? It's very beerish. <laughs> see, that's good. That's not overly sugary like that um like that bearded iris was. That was just too too much sweet for me, man. This is a little bit drier. It's still nicely funky. You've got a little bit of a little bit of tropical flavors on the back end, but nothing that tastes forced or added in. It's just a nice, yeah. New England style IPA. I'm on board. Oh, it's just a nice New England style IPA. You'll learn to love him. It's a nice one. <laughs> All right, Steve. Now that we're getting ourselves good and hydrated, how about before we get on into the movie review, how about we take a detour from, I guess, shitting all over everything. That's kind of what we've done. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was like, fuck Wonder Woman. Fuck this beer. <laughs> like, okay, let's get into some kind of good stuff and let's just step on in to the Positivity Palace. <laughs> hey, everybody, welcome on into the Preview Palace. You look Whoa. good, and you look good, and you look good today. <laughs> That's very positive. That's a little suspiciously yeah, it's positive. Yeah, me, Positive Pete. What are you hiding there, Positive Pete? That seems like you're a little Cocaine. suspiciously fun. Oh, oh, well, okay. Yeah, I get it. I get it. And let's talk about our top five, or whatever number you come up with, horror movies from 2020. Now, I have to preface this, Steve. I have been a very, very bad new horror movie watcher in the year of, mm-hmm. of 2020. Yeah. I I actually went through a list of like all the horror movies from this year, and I totaled them up, and I've seen five. Whoa. So, yeah, okay. it's bad. My top five is the five movies that I've seen. I Thankfully, mean, most of them I really the, enjoyed. The theaters weren't open. Like, when the I theaters so. are open, you see more movies. That's true. But I know that there's so many titles that came out this year that are fantastic yes, that there are I just didn't seek out. And it's the kind of thing where it's like, honestly, I bet if I looked back on all the movies that I watched this year, a lot of them were probably comfort food rewatches where it was just like, I just need something to turn my brain off for a minute here. You know, yeah, so, you don't want to have to experience a new thing and have to think it through. It's just, I just want to relax. But yeah, yeah, there, there have been a lot of good movies this year and I've, I I've seen a lot of them. I also missed a lot of them and going through like other top uh lists for this year or last year. Um I I saw so many movies that I was like I didn't even know that existed. So I'm excited yeah, to dude. get into to some of those, but I I saw a lot of good movies this year. Yeah, well, I'm glad to hear it. I'm glad to hear about them too because I know that I need to catch up and get on some of these cuz some of these flicks like um what is it called? Like the color out of space and stuff. Color like, out of space. I haven't watched yet. I haven't watched it, and I totally forgot that that came out this year. That seems like that came out forever ago. I know. Yeah, it's it's the year has been six years long. It's been yeah. the worst. Yeah. For fucking real, man. So yeah. D- so you know, don't uh, don't go crucifying me. Put down the cross and the nails. Come on. <laughs> yeah, I don't deserve it. I just haven't watched that much. Pity my ignorance. Of don't course smite do. me for it. Of course we do. <laughs> It makes sense. And uh, every, no, but I mean, let's all be uh, very gentle on each other again for several more months uh, because it, it, shit was fucky. It's fine. Yeah, it was a real fucky see, time. Yeah, it's fine if you didn't see a whole lot of new movies this year. Yeah, but you know, and also definitely want everybody to chime in on the Facebook group and yeah, stuff. Yeah, I'd and like to know. What let we us missed. know your favorites yeah. so that we'll know what we should be doing in 2021 and reviewing on the show because there's a lot of stuff that like you said i i didn't even know came out right uh that i missed out on so i look forward to getting into some of those but i'm gonna kick this off with i think the first yeah i'm looking at my list it is the first horror movie that i watched that was a new one this year and um whenever this came out it was a novel fun time because it was like oh movie theaters are closed wait we can just rent a new movie at home and watch it here how neat. Uh, so we, we rented The Invisible Man. Right. And it's not very good. I actually really don't like this uh, movie all that much. It's got so much like potential. and It does. And Lizzie Moss is great. She's great. And the you know making it about abuse and stuff really made all sorts of sense. 
Oh but yeah, it just Again, great failed themes. on so many different points yeah, where it, it could have easily succeeded. Um, but I I don't think it was terrible. I I would love to review it on the show. Like I said, I, I love the topics and some of the stuff discussed there. And it was a fun way to re-explore a classic, you know, horror monster of the Invisible Man and stuff. Cool way to do it, but overall I didn't really like it. Honestly, if I had seen one other good horror movie this year, it wouldn't have been on my list. But it's five because it's the fifth good one (laughs) I've watched this year, and that's all I got. Yeah, I just marked everyone off my list that I know you've seen because we've covered them. (laughs) Nice. (laughs) So... Uh, I'll start then with porno. I oh, love okay. porno. I heard about it's this. great. Said nobody ever. Am I right? Right. Who watches oh, that stuff? Yeah. Put some clothes on, people. Ew. Yucko. What if God <laughs> sees your nakedness? <laughs> <laughs> Can't be having that. He's going to be pissed. Yeah, I thought porno uh, was great. But, uh, like, your top five is going to have uh, a bunch of movies that I, I think are better than porno. But I... I wanted to be able to talk about 10 separate movies and porno, I think is solid as hell. And if you have any sort of religious background, will probably really resonate with you. Oh man. Okay. So I'm on board for yeah. sure. Yeah. <laughs> nice. uh, and it's also funny and has, uh, uh, <laughs> I don't want to ruin anything, but a moment, okay, all right. a moment that was just like, what? the fuck just happened awesome it's on shutter right yeah it's on shutter uh it, yeah it's an seo nightmare i said this before yeah just <laughs> searching for porno uh like oh porno what you 2020 do is, and it's like what well, yeah really still right porn. Like, <laughs> what you gotta do is google porno movie that sets it apart oh, obviously. porno movie i don't yeah. want to google yeah, you'll find porno, it porno horror I just don't want to find no. out what that is. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Ugh, ghastly. <laughs> What's your next one, Ben? Okay, number four on my top five is one that we talked about on the show. And the reason why I put this on my list is because I thought that it was just such a very appropriate time and place movie. I'm talking about Host, yeah, which was about 59 minutes of what everybody's been going through in 2020. And I really thought that they did it extremely well Mm -hmm. and they did it on no budget and they did it using, yeah. And they did it using what we're all using right now. Fucking zoom. That's all we got to talk to our friends and family and stuff. And I thought that it was just handled really well. It was a novel idea. It's not the most original thing in the world or anything like that, but it was all done very convincingly. And had a couple of a uh, couple of jumps in there for me too, and, yeah. and like I said, like it just really was the right time, right place, turning um, apples into applesauce, turning your lemons into limoncello in the year <laughs> of twenty and twenty. So I, I appreciate their resourcefulness and how quick they were to strike while the iron was hot. Well, Ben, I wanted to put an anthology on here, and I I struggled between the Mortuary Collection and Scare Package. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I heard Mer- Mortuary Collection was good, but I never it got to is. see it. I, I think Mortuary Collection is is probably the like more tight anthology where like everything kind of comes together with the wraparound story. But uh, Scare Package is also really good. So either one, both on Shutter, both worth a watch. You'll have a good time with yeah. it. Yeah, I really need to watch Mortuary. You know I love an anthology. Yeah, you'll like Mortuary Collection for sure, I think. Are you also noticing that I have a hard time saying the word mortuary? Mortuary. Mortu- mortu- mortuary. Mortuary. Oh, wait. Oh, wait. Mortuary. <laughs> yeah, you just got to say it like Buffalo Bill. Okay. Got it. <laughs> wait, try it <laughs> like Aragorn. See if that helps. Mortuary collection. Actually, it does. It does. I can do that. Mortuary collection. <laughs> For Frodo. For Frodo. <laughs> That's all I got, man. That's all I got. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, Mortuary Collection definitely worth a watch. Scare Package as well. I yeah. the one good anthologies. Excellent, a man. Coming up on my number three right here is the one that to my wife would call the number one of the year by a country mile. I'm not talking about no city miles neither. I'm talking about a country mile. Mm-hmm. We're born and raised. We're country strong. We know how long <laughs> of a mile that is. Right. It's but a long for one. me. Gretel and Hansel comes yeah. in at number three. And I totally forgot that that came out this year. 
Yeah, Gretel and Hansel. Fucking yeah. loved it. I, I really enjoyed it. I am glad that, that Kate and I think of it so highly because a lot of people don't. It uh I just I enjoyed everything about it. I liked the imagery, I liked the uh way the story played out, I liked the messaging and stuff. It was just it was Oh good. yeah. Oh yeah, and just I mean just a visual feast. Yeah. Absolutely fucking gorgeous. Uh I, I definitely think that it's very, very cool and worth a watch, especially if you're into, you know, a lot of those traditional European folk tales and stuff. Yeah, I think it's a, or just a witches. Spin if you're on. into witchery, you'll probably like it. Yeah, exactly. And you need to get saved. Like stat. <laughs> ASAP. <laughs> Gotta get that Satan out of you. Mm, you sure do. That's right. <laughs> what do you got coming in next on your list there, Steve? All right. So uh again, uh you said Gretel and Hansel, you said uh host. Both of those would have been on my list. Yeah. Uh, but one bedroom or one BR really oh, yeah. blew me away. You talked about that away. just a couple weeks ago. You said yeah. it was awesome. Blew me away for the low budget and number like number of unknown actors and stuff. How just fucking tense it gets and how like, brutal it can be. It's it's real solid. Though again, nice. I, I think it would probably be you know. Uh, just lower on my top 10 because uh, I, I would have Gretel and Hansel. I would definitely have Host and uh, I, I I know what your next three probably are just from yeah. what we've done. <laughs> and I would yeah. have those higher for sure. Right on, man. Yeah, I need to check that one out. Uh, whenever you told me about it, it sounded like something that would be right up my oh, alley. Oh, yeah. You, so. You're going to like it, I think. it's uh, man, it, There's some moments in there that are hard to watch. Word, man. Yeah. Well, I'm on board. Now, my number two pick is one that we did on the show just uh-huh. a couple of months ago. It's one that came out that featured our main man, Elijah Wood, who has yeah. been mentioned on the show many, many, many times. And it is just a weird, goofy, stupid uh-huh. horror comedy, I guess you'd call it more than anything. Yeah. I'm talking about Come to Daddy. Come to Daddy. So awesome. I loved it. And it was just yeah. out of nowhere. It was mm-hmm. just like, what the fuck is this movie? Yeah. And I watched it twice in like two days and still really, really enjoyed it. It's one that I think that I will watch again. I mean, it's by no means like, oh, this is in my top 10 of all time. It's not really like that, but it made me happy to watch and it looked really cool and it was just weird and stupid. Yeah. Uh, which really, really just hit the spot for me whenever I watched it. So I really enjoyed that one and thought it deserved a spot on my list. Fuck, I just realized something. I didn't put underwater on my list, and it definitely would have been on my list. Underwater oh, like is the, awesome. Go watch it. The Cthulhu one and shit, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Underwater. I forgot Kristen that came Stewart. out this year. Yeah. Go, go watch that. How long that. has this year been, dude? It's been a million years long. <laughs> wow. I meant to watch that, too, because that seemed like one that would be right up my alley. It seemed like something I would yeah, really, I think, really I enjoy. I think you'll like it. It's... It's tense from the moment it starts and like oh. just keeps up the intensity throughout. I, I really enjoyed it. But uh um, my my number two here is Possessor Uncut. And Okay, yeah. From the this, Cronenberg, the yeah, son of Cronenberg. This probably would have been my number three. Um but Possessor Uncut is so solidly like solid uh playing out of an idea, but also gory and brutal as hell Ooh, i'm on board already yes. yeah i saw like a trailer for it mm-hmm. that had like all these people that were like melting as though they were made of wax and <laughs> the the plot sounds kind of inceptiony in a way kind of but, but i'm guessing not, it's not huh? yeah far less convoluted and uh um, you know how inception is still giving you exposition like 10 minutes before it ends Lord, yes. This movie doesn't waste time doing that. <laughs> I like that about yeah. it already. I'll tell you that. Yeah. So, yeah. You watch Possessor. Uh, it's Brandon Cronenberg. Uh, you, you're going to get your body horror. You get some real brute, like, stuff you would not normally see in a horror movie that is just brutal as shit. So, yeah, I heard it had some brutal, it. like, practical effects kills and stuff yeah. like that in there that were really nasty. And it's got our, our guy, uh, Scene Bean, in it. Oh, well, Scene Bean, he's in there, huh? Scene Bean's in there, yeah. Sean Bond. Oh, Sean Bond. (laughs) (laughs) Nice, man. That's definitely on my to-watch list for sure. Maybe we'll do that one on the show sometime this year, too. Oh, yeah, I hope so. It's a great one. It's probably art, too, I think. Uh All right, my numero uno 
is a flick that we watched over the summer. It's one that my wife uh, found a trailer for, and we was walking out to get some some to-go food this one night, and I was like, what do you want to watch? And she said, watch this trailer, dickhead. And I was like, that's a little mean, but I will watch the trailer. And I watched it, and I was like, yep, let's watch this whenever we get home. We watched it. It made me extremely uneasy and tense, and it's maybe a little bit of a stretch to call it horror, but... I don't know what other kind of thing makes me feel so fucking uncomfortable and, you know, ball my fists up while I'm watching it. Um, Swallow is the movie that I'm talking oh, about. Right. I really thought that it yeah, was that's a... that's one I still haven't watched. Dude, I think that you would fucking Yeah, I, I love gotta it. get on it. Yeah, I wrote it down because I saw it on so many top ten Oh, lists. yeah. Yeah. It's, it's really, really good. It's very well put together. It's gorgeous. It definitely takes a lot of influence from... Rosemary's Baby in a lot of ways. Um, it, it tells the tale that we saw in that movie about women's bodily autonomy and stuff. Mm-hmm. And it's fucked up. It's really, really, really fucked up and will just, you know, toy with your emotions in a lot of ways. But I think just has a really solid message behind it and everything. I think it's a very, very fucking cool movie that probably flew under the radar for a lot of people because I think a lot of people probably watch the trailer and they're like, it's a movie about an eating disorder. I can't mm. relate to this. Next. And probably didn't give it a shot. But if you do, I think that you will be stunned by just how fucking tense this thing is. Really excellent. I can't think of any other um, of these movies that I've talked about, all five of them that I've watched this year that stuck with me quite like this one did. Well, I made a miscalculation, Ben. Okay. All right. We got a couple more on and, here. And um, and I think you also made a miscalculation because oh shit, you forgot that you saw Scare Me this year, which came out in 2020. Fuck. That was this year. That was this year. <laughs> but I loved Scare Me. I don't know where. Yeah, I don't know where you would have put it, but I would have put it as my number two. So I'll say it now. Uh, Scare Me is fucking great. Go listen Scare to our me, episode on dude. it, dude. It's wonderful. That absolutely would have yep. knocked shit ass Invisible Man off my list for right. sure. But it's that probably it, would have been in my top three. It's not for everybody for sure. No, like, no, a no, ton no. of people were like, "No, this isn't my thing." So, and I get it. Yeah, and I get it. That's fine. But it really, it really hit with me. So if, if um, you know, give it a chance. If you don't like it, fine. If you do like it, you're gonna love it. Man, but I can't believe I forgot about that one. My numero uno, and we'll be covering this uh, soonish, is yeah. his house. I Who's talked about house? it. His house. <laughs> he does not have <laughs> that fun little energy we just gave it. <laughs> oh no, it doesn't feature Run either, does it? It does not feature Reverend Run. No. Oh, uh, I wish it did. So uh, his house. I talked about it a few weeks ago. I, I watched yeah. it. It's on Netflix. It's about uh, African refugees in in England, and it is disturbing. It's got some imagery that is really dark and brutal. It's yeah. also got some some real uh, heart wrenching stuff to it. It's I mean it, it it is the most effective horror movie I saw all year for sure. Damn, because dude. It's, and you watched a lot. I watched a lot. It, it was because it's so real, it, it and it brings you into a world that you know about and you've read about, but it makes you experience it, and it's just Damn. Uh, uh, so brutal. Uh, I mean, and it's got a uh, Ruby from Lovecraft. Country. Yes, it He's does. Like and she's right? so fucking. Oh my god, Great she's an awesome. actress. Yeah, I love her. So. Uh, watch his house. We're we're gonna be covering it soon enough, but it, it's um it's so good, and I don't I don't want to ruin anything though about it because like it, it does have some like revelations as it goes that Damn. slowly just like man, it gets brutal. Fucking blow your hair back. Huh? It'll blow your hair back for sure. Yeah. Damn. Yeah, I watched like a trailer for that earlier because I knew nothing about it. Like I knew people were talking about it, and I knew that you'd seen it and really enjoyed yeah. it and stuff, but I didn't know anything about it. And the trailer for it looked hyper disturbing. It, it is. looked really fucking 
um, bizarre and dark. Yeah. So I'm really stoked to uh, to watch this one. Yeah. Do you think it's one that I should just wait until we do it for the show to watch, or is it the kind of thing where I should watch it and then rewatch it so I can glean more from it before uh, we do the episode? Well, maybe, huh? That's a good point because there's a lot you in know? there, and it's it's got like a lot of real world stuff going on there. Yeah. Damn, like the real world on MTV. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like Puck is in there. And then <laughs> that guy slaps that girl with Lyme disease. and <laughs> With the Lyme disease. Yeah, yeah. It was wild. <laughs> anyway, there were, there were some other like honorable mentions and stuff of stuff that I saw. But like, I, I think like the ones you named and the ones I named were, were all of my favorites. I didn't really miss anything. But th- there were a whole lot of good movies that came out this year. Yeah, definitely, man. And hopefully, you know, oh, last if year 20, by this time this comes last out, sorry. Year, yeah. <laughs> and hopefully if twenty twenty one turns out to be a, a brighter, shinier, happier year with less stuff to worry about and <laughs> agonize over. Hopefully That'd I can nice. get around to watching all the good stuff that twenty twenty had in it that was maybe just a little too a little too uh, heavy and too dark for me to take on yeah. during these trying times. <laughs> I think late 2021 through 2022 and 2023, we're going to see some really good horror because, one, people have had a lot of time to work mm-hmm. on projects, uh, you know, developing them. And two, the people have had a whole lot of horrific things happen. And that's exactly what spurs people to make these great horror movies is is dealing with terrible traumatic things in in life uh so i I think we're gonna see a lot of horror coming out of this that is gonna be able to express the feelings we've all been having yeah i think that you're probably right um and, and it's like you said we we often do have amazing waves of art yeah after Really fucking awful times. Yeah. I mean, the, the the renaissance happened to come after the Black Plague. Gee, I wonder if there's a connection there. <laughs> the development of film came after World War One. Like the real development of like the the uh, German Expressionism uh, and stuff like that. Like really came following World War One. Yeah. So maybe we'll see some of that. You know, coming out of the fallout of uh, yeah the so entire COVID nineteen positivity show. can come out of uh, this terrible thing that has occurred yeah which is all the more reason to be responsible and safe and try to take care of yourself and others so that way you can be alive to fucking see it yeah absolutely because we only got a few more months of this hopefully i hope that you are inoculated hopefully get your vaccine spoilers they won't but i hope they do i know i know but at least i'll be able to go back to the gym and that's same that's what really matters (laughs) yeah no doubt man (laughs) All right, Steve, so now that we've got our little 2020 wrap-up finished with, let's move on here and dive deep into this super gross and fun movie known as Slyther. That's it, Slyther. Uh Uh-huh. Uh-huh, Slyther, the one who (laughs) slithes. Right? Yeah, that's it. 2006 joint by Uh James Gunn. Yeah. Man, so this movie is, is uh, uh, critically was well received and has a cult following, but it failed at the time. Yeah, not a hit, man. Not a hit. And so I was looking up why that was, and one of the reasons was people thought it was a ripoff of, uh, of uh, Night of the Creeps. Right, yeah. Starts with an asteroid hurtling to Earth, sure. all that kind of stuff. Yeah. But it's like, I mean... I think there was some other stuff in 2006 era that was also pretty derivative that people yeah. seem to kind of eat up, right? It's really weird, yeah, that people looked at this and thought, oh, that's derivative of a, a kind of obscure 80s movie that yeah. itself was paying homage to tons of horror movies. Uh, the That year, the top grossing horror movies were Saw 3, The Omen, Final Destination. Oh, is that, is that like fucking near shot for shot line for line mm-hmm. remake of the omen that's basically the exact same thing as the original not right. derivative at all yep final destination three when a stranger calls another remake and then hostile hmm. so two sequels two remakes and torture porn 
Hmm, but this wasn't original this enough. This wasn't so original this. enough. Yeah, I, I, yeah I, where's the line I think there? we were struggling for things to complain about maybe in 2006. <laughs> Life was just too good. That's the problem, too man. good that people yep. were like, that's basically Night of the Creeps. You know how we all know that movie, right? No, we <laughs> no, don't. No. 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 Uh-uh. Uh, and it's not just Night of the Creeps. That's exactly the point of the movie, is it is homage to so many great horror movies. It is Tons James Gunn saying, I love horror. That's what I feel like, too, man. It seems like a fun celebration of and not a, oh, I couldn't come up with any of my own ideas, so I just picked this from this movie and I copied this from this other flick. It doesn't feel like that to me at all. No, it's not that at all. It, it, is, uh, uh, it is his own aesthetic. Like, he is pulling all these things in in a very interesting way, but at no point does it feel like a mishmash. It Mm -mm, feels like, oh, this is who James Gunn is. Yeah. And it is. I mean, we've seen it more and more. Like, he's he has a very definitive aesthetic in his movies. Oh, yeah. And it was established early, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. So, the this movie, I think, is honestly probably one of the best movies of the the 2000s i like, think so too probably one of the best horror movies of the 2000s and one of the more unique ones in you know in a way that uh you just don't see in a lot of those early to mid 2000s movies like just so oh, many yeah. remakes so many sequels so many just like cash-ins and this this is unique and and uh a love of horror put on screen i think so too man and that range of influences that you're talking about too that are on display here and definitely being paid homage to are all themselves really fantastic flicks like there's yeah. there's obviously a lot of evil dead in here there's like a spirit there's vision shot dead. through the woods at yeah. the first of the movie that is I'm gonna, very sam raimi i'm gonna i'm gonna pull you through some of these uh homage references Okay. Throughout the movie. Now, you you just named one that's early in the movie. The Evil Dead shot through the woods of the thing coming from outer space. The thing coming from outer space, as I said earlier, a uh, huge trope throughout the 80s in horror movies. Oh, so yeah. it's homage to so many things. Yeah, uh, which one do you want to say it's copying? Right. Like you have like nine to choose from. I think least. in this case, it's probably closest to the 1958 The Blob. But that's what all those movies were imitating. So it's yeah. it's all of them kind of mishmashed. But then you get the Evil Dead shots through the woods. Um, when we see the town, there's so many just like horror references put in there. There is the R.J. McCready uh, uh, oh, auction yeah, house and and uh-huh. funeral home. R.J. McCready, the character from the thing. Then we, also, also, what a wonderfully southern thing to have in a town. Auction house and funeral and home. And funeral like, home, yeah. That's southern as fuck. Yes, Very accurate. Uh, there's also the Hennenlauter Saddle Lodge, which is a reference to Frank Hennenlauter, who directed Basket Case and Brain Damage. This takes Whoa. a lot of homage from Brain Damage and Basket Case. So, that totally flew over my head. I did not catch that. Yeah. Uh, there's also a store called Max Renz, which is a reference to Videodrome. There's Earl Bassett Community School, which is a reference to Earl Bassett from Tremors. There's Damn, the, I didn't notice that one either. I know. There is so many in here. There's the Reglan Farm, which is a reference to The Brood. There's the Castavet Farm, which is a reference to Rosemary's Baby. Right, yep. Um, there. Uh, we also have Jack McCready, who is named after Jack Burton of Big Trouble in Little China. And there RJ McCready of the thing, so John Just Carpenter a big old references. Kurt Russell love fest. Yeah, right and a there. Kurt Russell love fest. Um, there's also, strangely enough, a uh, society in here. <laughs> like, yes, I was gonna say, don't like, see a very lot overt. of homage to society in movies. No, so that's no. awesome to see. Oh um, yeah, yeah. Whenever you got all those people dog piling up and fucking merging together, I was like. Holy shit, this is straight out of society. Yes. There's also um, Elizabeth Banks is a classic Hitchcock blonde. Uh, I guess so, yeah. yeah Even she, the haircut and stuff is very classic yes. Hitchcock kind of aesthetic. And there's also a psycho shower scene homage where basically his knife is his huh. two tentacle dicks and he 
all you know is standing there considering tentacle dicking her uh yeah. and it is of course grant grant in the brain that stops him from doing that but uh so psycho uh, homage there there's so much homage throughout this that it is insane to think of this movie as uh, a rip off of one movie <laughs> It is so oh, know, many right? movies distilled down into all this awesome greatness. Uh, some influences that I haven't mentioned so far, Shivers and The Brood, both Cronenberg movies. Uh, the the manga Uzumaki by Junji Ito. Mm -hmm. uh, then, of course, The Fly. and Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Return of the Living Dead. Uh, I also men in black i would say specifically the scene where he comes in and says meat like it's very <laughs> much the sugar like it's yeah <laughs> uh also alien uh predator oh, yeah. the the thing makes like a predator noise and then becomes does, an alien face thing, hugger type yeah. of thing yeah uh, uh -huh. and also uh this got from clinton hale who was in uh, like a, a Q and A thing with James Gunn once, and James Gunn mentioned that Plan Nine from Outer Space is also uh, an inspiration for this, and I saw wow. that as well. So this movie is steeped in horror, but a lot of it's really weird and obscure. Some of it is, I yeah. think, like probably the most on the nose mainstream. Uh, overt reference this makes is definitely that Nightmare on Elm Street shot with the girl in the tub. Well, that's actually, strangely enough, not even referencing Nightmare on Elm Street specifically. It's referencing Shivers. David Cronenberg Shivers has a scene like that, which, you know, again, it does look very much like the Nightmare on Elm Street too. I saw which that too. Which did it first? Uh, Shivers did it first. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So that's cool, man, because you're seeing that like, to me, I read that as an Elm Street reference, me but too, even yeah. that was probably Wes Craven referencing that other movie, Shivers. where it's like yeah. everybody yeah. kind of is influenced by everybody, and everybody takes inspiration from everybody. That's just yeah. that's fucking art, man. That's every every type of media and every type of art. So, yeah, you're right. Well, it, to kind of peg this thing down as like, oh, it ripped off that one movie is like, I guess you haven't seen like a million other movies that this thing took influence from, if that's all I, that stands out to you. <laughs> look at Fred Decker's Night of the Creeps. There are characters in there named Raimi and Cronenberg. Like, it, it, the movie Very itself over, yeah. has so many other references and homage. Like, if you're saying, oh, it's it's just ripping off this one movie, it's like, well, that movie was ripping off a ton of movies. So, like, <laughs> what are you talking about? Right. Yeah, for sure, man. And I also feel like there's a a pretty strong trauma thread yes. running through this, well, that... which whenever you, you learn about the history of James Gunn, which mm -hmm. I did not know until you told me, makes perfect sense why yeah. he wove this thread of like okay it's a horror movie but it's also really stupid and gross and funny yes uh, and also too obviously it's like you have a trauma movie in, in this movie, movie. This yeah he has she's on watching TV. toxic crusader yes yep and <laughs> lloyd kaufman is in the fucking movie Lloyd kaufman's in the movie he had a line but it got cut but yeah he plays oh, a drunk really? in the uh in the uh police station yeah yeah, it's, uh, I mean, it's very much steeped in trauma because James Gunn started at trauma. He, he I wrote, had no idea. Uh, Tromeo and Juliet, which wow. uh, we'll have to cover sometime on the show. I've talked about uh, several times. I think it's well worth talking about. It uh, is narrated by Lemmy, and <laughs> there is a sentient dick in it. So it, it's it, well worth being like talked Amazing. about on this show. But yeah, he yeah. started with Lloyd Kaufman, and he and Lloyd Kaufman even co-wrote like a book on how to make movies trauma style. So wow, like he's very much steeped in trauma. But he also he he's one of those directors who started with making uh, silly zombie movies uh, in the backyard with his brothers, uh, his brothers who are writers or uh, as well as Sean Gunn who is an actor. So like they all started in their backyard similar to like sam raimi and and uh what's his brother's name fuck ted, ted. <laughs> yeah sam and ted like you know similar to sam and ted and bruce campbell all just making stuff together it uh it's it's exactly but, but you didn't mention his other brother tommy gunn <laughs> the who star? lives in infamy yeah as yeah. we all know yeah, yeah all right 
<laughs> you yeah. got into film though i mean he's still in the in the industry in a way that's true that's true uh so yeah he's yeah this is he's just a, a guy who loves horror and and has been steeped in horror and this is his first movie that he's directing on his own and he really just brought all of his influences and pulled it together in a way that was his own voice yeah and it's wild too seeing how well developed his own voice was here because you know i watched this movie for the first time i'm gonna guess maybe 2010 like it was a long time ago and i actually hadn't seen it until we decided to do it again uh for the show i hadn't seen it again since then so you know, considering that in that interim period there, we've seen him do stuff with um, the MCU and all that. Like, I was kind of going into this movie remembering how gross it was and stuff and how it was like kind of a B-horror movie in a lot of ways. I tried to watch it through the lens of like, now, can you believe this guy made Guardians of the Galaxy? But the thing is, is whenever you watch it, yeah, you absolutely can. You absolutely yeah. can believe this is the same guy because that voice of being able to do this crazy sci-fi uh very again b-movie comic booky kind of action and stuff on screen while also infusing it with humor uh, it's very very apparent in this like this totally does feel like the same guy that made guardians uh, whereas like if you go back and you watch peter jackson's bad taste and you're like can you believe this is a guy that did lord of the rings you'd right be like, no <laughs> that is i do not jump. believe that right <laughs> this already felt like James Gunn had his voice figured out and he finally got to make his own movie, which is a feat in itself. Here, Here's the thing. The, James Gunn was mostly a writer up to this point, and here are some of the movies he had a hand in. He did oh. an uncredited uh, screenplay rewrites on 13 Ghosts, which okay. uh, is fine. He wrote the screenplay for Scooby-Doo. Oh, and then wow. huge in 2004 he wrote the screenplay for dawn of the dead remake and scooby-doo 2 monsters unleashed they came out in back-to-back -back weeks and were the number one movies in those weeks dude whoa so he already had a ton of like experience and success in developing his own tone and you go back and watch those scooby-doo movies which i did uh, a few years ago before we uh, talked about scream i think i've never seen them oh you haven't no we should do them on the show sometime that'd be fun yeah that would be uh scooby-doo well worth watching i mean you're, you're talking about a cast that is like the people from all the horror movies in the 90s you got sarah michelle geller uh freddie prince jr you got uh oh what's his name yeah damn it uh he played uh Stu in in scream uh, oh yeah yeah jamie kennedy not jamie no. Ken god damn it not the Stu. other guy the other, i'm thinking of matthew lillard god damn there it. you go ah, boom there we go uh you got matthew lillard yeah it's it's uh like it's got the james gunn feel to it but it's also you know a cartoony silly movie it, it's fun so in addition to him already having his his voice figured out by this point with all those flicks that he had a hand in, which is crazy. I didn't know how many of those that he had already done by this point. Yeah. I think part of what makes this movie work so well is the cast because he yeah. managed to rope in a lot of people that aren't even necessarily like giant A-list names. You know, like this doesn't Not have fucking time, Tom Cruise or anybody sure. in it. Right. But they were definitely people that he already knew could do the job yeah. and- Everybody in this is fucking awesome. I yeah. had totally forgotten that Nathan Fillion was in this movie. He's so good. Yeah, this is. I mean, this is after Firefly, so he's you know popular, but yeah, uh, his legend has only grown over the years. Oh yeah, he's become... Firefly, a series that I've not watched, but I have just, I've just made a solemn vow you need to, to my wife that we will watch oh it. yeah you need to and you need to watch it in the correct order like correct order. look up the correct order. yeah because fox okay. broadcast them all out of order and i don't i don't know if they stream in the correct order but like oh yeah fox fucked that show anyway uh so yeah you got nathan fillion who's fucking awesome and amazing you got elizabeth banks 
uh, Starla Grant here. She had done uh, uh, Wet Hot American Summer, and she was uh, Betty Brant in Spider Man. But you know, nothing, nothing huge. Up yeah, to this, this point. is even before like Forty Year Old Virgin and stuff. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. She's uh, she's not even gotten into the Judd Apatow movies yet. I don't think. Wow. Uh, so th- yeah, this is you know early on Elizabeth Banks before she she's huge. Uh, she's always been great. Like, yeah. I, what what is it about her? She just solid every single. I know. Thing she's in. Yeah. Totally agree, man. I always see her as, as Miri Linky. I always think of her as uh-huh. Zach and Miri. Right. That's yeah. just always her character to me. Yeah. Uh, I think did that. You're right. It's like everything like she's been the in year has been before good. this, maybe, or maybe the year after this. That wow. they came out around this time. You're probably right. Yeah. yeah. It's been a minute. Mm-hmm. So yeah. Then you have Michael Rooker, who is a fucking legend. Oh yeah, and probably the biggest name in yeah, this in the movie because he he'd time, been in yeah. you know Henry Portrait of a Serial Killer, yeah, Mall Days Rats, of Thunder, yeah, Days of Thunder, all sorts of shit. Like he his his IMDb is gigantic. He's been in so and that much guy, stuff. dude. He's one of those cats that I think just chooses movies that he is interested in doing to work on like his his uh filmography of stuff that he's been in it's always stuff where like he can choose to be some kind of weird fun character right uh no matter what it is like he doesn't seem like the kind of guy that just takes anything that lands in his lap no, he always yeah, he chooses stuff where he can really seek, express himself and do well into, yeah and go totally go into the role. yeah yep he he's he's great my uh michael rooker story i may have told it on the show before i was standing in line at uh uh uh, uh doug loves movies podcast recording i was talking to these uh two guys and i saw michael rooker walking across the crosswalk and i was like oh he's probably gonna be the guest tonight and right around that time one of the guys was like Hey, who do you think will be the guest tonight? And I was like, Michael Rooker. And they were like, Oh, that's weird. <laughs> like, why would you think that? <laughs> Random poll, but yeah. okay. And then we went in and sat down, and Michael Rooker came out, and it was just like, Oh, that's <laughs> crazy. This man is a psychic. But then also, James and Sean Gunn came out, uh, and I met all three of them afterwards. Super nice guys. No shit. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Michael that's Rooker, really cool. very very sweet dude. Very Which nice one guy. is Sean Gunn? Sean Gunn is uh he was he was Kirk in Gilmore Girls. He's God damn it! I thought that was yeah. him. Yeah, that's actually He's I was also super Guardians excited to too. meet him because of that. I was like, I, I was like, I, I know everybody loves you in Guardians or whatever, but I'm a huge fan of Gilmore Girls, and he just <laughs> laughed at me. Yeah. That's awesome, man. Yeah. Is he in this too? Because I swear, like. Towards the end of the movie, whenever no. they're all assimilating in, there's a guy that looks just like him. In you know the, what? I would believe that. I would believe that James Gunn snuck him in, but I, I right? didn't see him as uncredited or anything. So, I no. swear it looks yeah. just like him, man. <laughs> that guy's yeah. awesome. Yeah, he's awesome. Damn, dude. Yeah, killer cast in this. Yeah, I think that so everybody does a really, really good job, and it's one of those flicks that everybody from you know the the main stars that we mentioned all the way down to all the you know, deputies and the secretary working and that at little the uh, secretary police station. Who we've never seen in anything else, right? No, right. Uh, no. Jenna, uh, Jenna I don't Fisher, think she's ever been in a show or anything. Yeah, Jenna Fisher, who was married to James Gunn at the time, so they had another actor in the role, and that actor had to quit because they had a pilot that got picked up, and so they needed someone quick. And James Gunn was like, "Well, you know, my wife can do it," so they brought in. Uh, the Jenna Fisher and while they were filming she, like I guess the office season one had started airing so by the mm. time they were coming around to like we need to promote this Jenna Fisher was the biggest name in the cast <laughs> so oh, shit. they sent her out to like the, the night show and stuff to promote this movie she's barely in <laughs> Dude, that's funny. Yeah, because yeah, she's not really in here much, but when she's in here, she's... Oh, she's hilarious, yeah. Hilarious as shit, man. And one thing that I think everybody in this does so well, other than just clearly understanding the tone of the movie that they're in, which yeah. is, again, rooted in B-movie schlock. Right. But is ultimately this funny, 
uh, very self-aware right. horror movie. One thing that I think everybody does so well, which I forgot was a huge element of this story, is act fucking Southern. Uh-huh. This is set in, I think it's South Clifton, Carolina. South Carolina? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's South Carolina. And it is it is surprising because other than Michael Rooker, uh, I don't know if any of them are from the South. A lot of them are Canadian. Damn. Uh, uh, and they nail it. Uh, and that has yeah. to do with the writing because so many of the line the lines are exactly the way someone from the South would say oh that. Oh, my God. Like, dude, and that's the thing that really got good to me, dude, is me like too, there's yeah. so many movies that we watch that are, you know, quote unquote Southern, and it's just like. Yeah, that's not how Yeah, okay. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Th- no, no, that's not really exactly it at all. But this feels so accurate in so many ways, even down to, like you said, some of those little phrases and expressions that people in this use that are like. Yeah, yeah, I've heard that. <laughs> mm-hmm. I, I the line foreign stuff is classy if you know something yeah. is Dude, something it, that man. every single one of us who grew up in the South and knew there was a like a world out there, to the world <laughs> like the, we all went through that phase where just anything that wasn't where we were was yeah. more important and more special somehow automatically classic yeah yep yeah that just <laughs> but then the it. thing that's so funny too is, is like at the at the end of the day her fancy japanese fingernail job <laughs> saves her life yeah. because yeah it's when she sinks into the little worm uh-huh. thing that's trying to crawl down her throat and it, well, it turns out that that shit saves her <laughs> well and i mean this this movie does have like a point at its heart and uh it it, it is about like uh, uh abuse in relationships and how uh, a, an obsessive sort of controlling abuser can make the world feel like you cannot escape them mm-hmm. and she uh what's wait, what's her name with the nails damn it uh Ky- kylie kylie, kylie yeah. kind of represents this early version of starla who still has mm. the means to get out like she doesn't mm-hmm. have to get stuck here with a Grant Grant, which is just Grant fucking Grant. hilarious. That is hilarious. <laughs> but like it, that's that's kind of the message of the movie is that the, these two are being compared, and and it, it you know Starla is seeing that like yeah she 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 made a bad decision at seventeen, but more she was coerced and abused by an older man. Yeah, and, taking advantage of her situation, yeah. and yeah. and she she could have more. Like that's one thing she wanted to run away to Hollywood. So like, there's this very clear connection between her and Kylie, and this desire to get out of this podunk town and be more or whatever. And yeah. in the end, uh, they all have to get out of the podunk town. <laughs> like, that's true. Yeah, yeah, at the end, they all got to get the fuck out. Right, the podunk town is dead. <laughs> so there, there is messaging to it. So like, you know, Kylie, Kylie's nails, uh, saving her is kind of an important element where it's, it's her desire hmm. to escape this hive mind. That yeah. Small yeah. Town to be something life, more, something small, bigger. Yeah. Rural small town life turns into this hive mind where everybody kind of thinks the same and nobody sees anything other than everybody the just wants to be, be together and yeah. fucking breed breed with each other indefinitely yeah. and mm-hmm. i mean that is small town living when, you, when you look at it that way it yeah. really really is so her desire to do more you know to have these the the you know nails done by a japanese girl so that makes them more you know special you know it's a, it's a little silly thing that we know isn't that important but it shows her mindset that she wants to get out of the town so she is this reflection of starla and mm-hmm. i know like some people are listening and being like are why are you finding deep meaning in slither there is deep meaning in slither i'm not finding it it's just there it's yeah it's just slither is much more of a funny movie with a lot of crazy gore and stuff but there's there's deep meaning in some of this that really is like trying to get at something but doing it in a fun way that never never like overly like um highlights the message it just has it there and if you want to look for it it's there and if you don't you can just enjoy this movie with all this gore yeah and you can enjoy all the hilarious comedic stuff in yeah. here this movie it's dude, so like, funny. in my mind 
you know, after having watched it years ago, the biggest thing I remembered about it is that it's gross. <laughs> but I think somehow in the back of my head, the comedic elements of this movie got pushed aside. This movie's fucking hilarious. Yeah. And a lot of it is, as you said, based around those Southern yep. isms that a lot of these characters have. The, the, the mayor in particular has so many of the fucking funniest <laughs> lines. But you and I both connected over the, the, the funniest, mis- most doc- accurately yeah. Southern line in the movie. The Mr. Pib. Yeah, where he I, I wrote it down <laughs> just so I can get it exactly right. Yeah, because he said it so perfectly Perfect. southern. It, I mean, you 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 couldn't like you couldn't luck into this. James Gunn obviously did his his work and his research, but this is when they're escaping, and he says, "I told your secretary to pack, Mister Pib. It's the only Coke I like." <laughs> In the South, we call all soda Coke. Yeah, it's all soft drinks are Coke. What kind of Coke you want? What I'm kind of Sprite. Coke you want? Yeah, that's it, man. Yeah. <laughs> Even if they serve Pepsi, like that's the only thing what kind of Coke you want? I'll have a Diet yeah. Pepsi, I guess. <laughs> but it's like, that's so insanely accurately Southern, and you would really only know that if you spent some time here. Yeah. Like, I want to know... Who came up with that line? Like, is that something that one of the actors came up with? Is that something that Gunn knew about the South? Well, is that I mean, James we Gunn call is, everything Coke? I don't he's know. He's from Missouri. I don't know. Uh, cause Missouri like, is parts, Yankee country, y- Steve. Well, <laughs> I mean, they, they, they were. They're from Hamlin County, Tennessee, Steve. They were they're a Yankees. slave state. Uh, <laughs> they, <laughs> well. Parts of Missouri are definitely be- very Southern. So it's possible they say Coke, though I imagine they say pop because it's, you know, that region. I don't know. If you're from Missouri, let us know. (laughs) Yeah, what do you call it anyway, huh? But yeah, there's so many good lines in here, dude. One of my favorite parts in the whole movie is that part where uh, Nathan Fillion is calling like his secretary back at the office. Mm-hmm. And oh, yeah. she's like, by the way, your mama called about that toilet overflowing again. She said it's because of what you did in there on Sunday. <laughs> yeah. Like in this moment where it's like we're facing a legit alien invasion and this is still something you feel obligated to tell me about. That's a, that, again, very Southern. That's yeah, very Southern because like, it's like, well, his mom told me to say this. I'm not going to be I'm not going to disrespect his mama. So I'm going to say yeah. it, no matter what the hell's happening. <laughs> and then the way he backpedals and is like, she got this big old tree grows in the front yard, the, the roots grab and pops, and she uses too much paper. <laughs> she uses too much paper, yeah. yeah. yeah He's Nathan hilarious. Fillion Nathan does, Fillion is hysterical. Yeah, he does such a great job throughout of, it, what it is is like he's playing the, you know, in over his head, but still like, he's he's the hero, but he's not like, a hero hero like he fails a lot oh yeah he needs a whole lot of help like the movie is really about starla overcoming grant not mm-hmm. about nathan fillion but nathan fillion is there as this like i i would say comic relief though it's not like overtly comedic it's just he's funny because of how like uh, how overwhelmed he is, but still like that southern calm. Yeah, he's trying to play it cool. Yeah, like he's trying to play it cool, but it's he's not cool. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, man, I'm I'm drinking on this damn seven percent beer right now, and I'm trying to get a buzz on, but I I just can't. I reckon it's because I got too much muscle mass. <laughs> That's so funny. What, it's so what funny. A, and again, that is that is exactly the way some dudes flirt. <laughs> yeah dude <laughs> it, it nails it yeah like there's just so much like really funny stuff in here but then like there's a a, a tentacle rape scene essentially Woo! A, sure that is turns into a, a a woman who is filled like a tick with slugs that dude it, like the body horror in this is so very, yeah very very there gross it, it just yeah, like it is. really like gets under but dude, my skin for sure even whenever they go to the barn and they see that woman who is blown up like a <laughs> fucking balloon or like that chicken willy wonka yeah. and, and she's like i didn't really want nobody to see me like this yeah. like that is such a fucking southern you way to respond the it's possum not, over there yeah i'm just really hungry just give me a piece of that possum over there just a little bit mm-hmm. like 
the response of I didn't want nobody to see me like this. Yeah, that's so southern. For sure. That's so fucking so. It's not, what the fuck's going on? Help (laughs) me. This is fucking crazy. It's, well, oh, I didn't really want to bother nobody. (laughs) That's exactly the way that everybody's mammal would respond to this, man. (laughs) Oh, my God, man. So fucking crazy. And I love, too, that that's a practical effect. Like, she's in a big balloon suit, I guess. She is. She is. And uh, and Brenda James, who played that, has some claustrophobia. So that was real tough for her. Also, she's a vegetarian. And had to sit around a whole bunch of <laughs> stinky meat for a bunch of things. So, way to go, Brenda James. Wow, dude. Wow. And hey, I'll tell you what, too, about all that meat and stuff like that. You know, here recently we did that Return of the King. Uh-huh. Or sorry, not the Return of the King, uh, the Two, two Towers. towers yeah. Which is, of course, a very, you know, anti-keto, anti-paleo <laughs> right. movie. I feel like the theme is continuing here, Steve. I think we just happened to pluck up another anti-keto message movie because these people that's up to nothing but eating meat all the time they ain't doing no good i'll tell you that that's true that is true wow (laughs) it would be funny if like it showed everybody who wasn't like infected just eating bread at every moment all the time yeah and they're doing great (laughs) they're doing fine everything's going they're doing just fine man (laughs) yeah dude the comedic elements in this i think are just so funny and it's like there's some stuff that is very overtly funny and then there's just other little subtle stuff like just how dumb it is that they put these little squid stickers on that map in the police station to to mark their sightings of the guy stickers too they're like glittery yeah it's so cute so dumb man (laughs) like just the idea that somebody brought in that stationary to the office so they could mark the sightings on the map so good that's small town shit man you think about it for a second who would have gone and bought those? The secretary, Jenna Fisher. And yeah. they continually show that she's like kind of aloof and airheaded. So You're like, nodding right now, aren't you? Yeah, she was <laughs> nodding instead of answering him on the phone. Like, on the phone. Yeah. So, of course, <laughs> so that's stupid. what she would buy. <laughs> She'd be like, oh, those are cute. <laughs> yeah. Well, they said he looked kind of like a squid, yeah. so... <laughs> And dude, yeah. just the explanation too. Like, this is another one of those like very small town things. The way that people just like try to write off stuff that's happening Everything. as some other totally yeah, minor thing that's deal. not related. Yeah. Mm-hmm. He's got Lyme disease. You know, mm-hmm. you go you go out hunting a deer and you eat a sandwich, you get shit on your hands, and it's just Lyme disease. <laughs> Lyme disease make you turn into a squid. <laughs> yeah. Well, and then even too, like one of the lines that really cracked me up is. Later on in the movie, whenever some of those police officers are clearly turning because they've been infected, and they're like, "What? what's all over your face and stuff? And they're like, uh, there's some poison ivy out there in the backyard. Yeah, we're real itchy. Yeah, that's, <laughs> the family says that. Uh, and yeah, I, there's actually a lot of lines that oh, are the repeated. Family, yeah. There are a lot of lines that are repeated throughout that, that kind of, you know, set up tone and stuff. I really enjoy that. Yeah, it... It... it it matches that so and that is what it's going for uh again i think is that the hive mind idea of that like just real enclosed community how they can you know easily be you know just dim-witted or or just a like uninformed about the world because they found this insular little group that they can just keep all of their drama in this tiny little area so everything else just doesn't matter so all right ben i was talking earlier about like the inspirations and stuff yeah and one that stood out to me was that the final form aside from being a reference to society and the shunting for sure. The final form also looks like the master from Fallout 2. Oh, I thought you meant that Paul Thomas Anderson movie, The Master, <laughs> like, which yeah, was looks... really terrible. <laughs> you didn't like The Master? I hated that movie, dude. Wow, Fuck. okay. It was just a big old fart sniff fest to me, man. Well, I mean, sometimes farts smell good. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, the the master from Fallout 2 looks kind of like what we see Grant as at the end. Okay. 
after this movie came out, Fallout 3, then Fallout New Vegas came out, and they introduced a new enemy type, the Centaur. And it looks like the middle transition period of Grant. When he's, like when he's like, out in the field? When and he's stuff? out in the field. Oh. So there's this, like, Fallout connection that I... I it's kind of a dialogue, a little back yeah, and forth really there. Huh? I liked that. I, I thought that was a, a, a neat little element to it. The this movie is just um I, I mean it's it's just a real celebration of some of the obscure weird horror that needed to be remembered. It needs to be remembered again now. Like this is the type of stuff that that we need, I think. It's kind of absurd, kind of weird, kind of dealing with real world issues, but also funny and light. But also oh, yeah. brutal and dark. Yeah, yeah, it, for sure, It just man. hits all the the feelings. And speaking of brutal, this movie has some really brutal and disgusting and gory shit in it, which makes it so fucking fun. It's one of those deals where you're watching this stuff happen that is so disgusting that you laugh uh-huh. because it's so overtly gross. Like, uh, earlier you mentioned that scene with, like, the fucking two tentacle, you know, dick impregnation scene that's like preceded by that countdown to when deer season starts like dude deer hunting season deer cheer all that shit yeah and, is and also and so perfectly that, like uh like fun little going down to the bar to spend some money song while the, yeah. the brutal like rape like scene it is very much like sexual like, they both yeah. seem to have orgasmic reactions, but, like, on a different scale. Like, he's happy and she is in torture. Yeah, it's really fucking strange yeah. and gross. And it's that, so gross. They they definitely, like, those tentacles were supposed to be sexual. Like, that scene is very much, like, playing on the sexual nature of what's happening, and that's why it is a rape scene. Uh, oh, dude. I mean, there's all kinds of sexual overtones throughout the entire uh, breeding process and yeah. uh, and everything of these of these alien creatures. I mean, even that very first thing that we see in the movie, this little blob fish looking creature mm-hmm. that like, uh, you know, shoots off the little thing into Grant Grant there. Like, it's extremely, extremely yonic whenever yeah. that thing opens up yep. and stuff. And then, like you said, you get all these dick creatures and penetration and... There's all kinds of very sexual overtones throughout this entire thing. I think it's pretty impossible to ignore them, really. I mean, one that stood out to me was, so at the end, uh, uh, Nathan Fillion, Bill, he gets one of the things stuck in his side. He pulls that out, and cum comes out of the wound. Yeah, totally. It's gushing. Yeah, that is very much semen. Like... It, they they made the sexual element of it very overt, very and very much so. It it does make it like dirtier and grosser, and also like adds to the like, I guess like, uh, what, what would you say like, it what is this creature? It's some sort of infection like what is it it is right like is it a is it a possession does it turn people into zombies like yeah. what exactly is it it's kind of hard to define yeah so like th- that is like it, it turns sex into this very like sort of chemically uh infectiony type of thing and less of mm-hmm. a less of an intimate like pleasurable act it is is this gross terrible shunting type of thing totally man and i think it's cool too that we get a little bit of a vision of the of the life cycle of this creature very much like we do in alien where it's like there's the face hugger there's the xenomorph like it's kind of loosely tied together in this where it's like okay there's the host the host impregnates the balloon woman who lets loose these slugs that inhabit Mm -hmm. people that serve the host and join the original host, like it's a complicated life cycle that these things go through. It's not just a simple, you know, birth, reproduction, death sort of cycle, which makes it, I think, more alien and more strange yeah. to try to understand the cycle of exactly what is going on here. And it seems like 
the, the the parasite, if you want to call it that, whenever right. it takes over old Grant Grant there, it seems like he still has a little bit of himself left that he can feel and maybe fight off at times. Like, yeah, that's like you said, during that shower scene, it, it seems to kind of like stop him yeah. whenever he looks at her and realizes like, I don't want to hurt this person. Yeah. This person means something to me. Like, there's still something there that's still him. Well, if we take if we take the writer's uh, intention as voice of God, which I rarely do, but I think sometimes it illuminates the script. James Gunn said that the moment it goes into his brain, Grant dies. Like Grant is dead. Well, he even for- says, "Yeah, she, like whenever he shows up at that chick's house, she's yeah. like, you look like you died, or I thought yeah. you died." And he's like, "I did." Uh huh. Yeah, so he's dead, (laughs) but his obsessive, controlling love of Starla is so, like, strong and persistent that he essentially gains some sort of control, or it at least assimilates that element of him Mm -hmm. and, and uses that to spread. Well, it makes you kind of wonder if there is some sort of two way exchange of of memory and stuff because as we see whenever Kylie gets you know partially infected you know she gets the a little bit of a glimpse into the memories of this hive mind and stuff so you kind of got to wonder like if it's a little bit of a two-way exchange where you know the host or sorry the the alien whenever it taps into Grant Grant as the host gets a little glimpse of like this is a special person don't harm this person uh it makes you wonder yeah yeah i i mean it's it's a very interesting like the 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 whole creature itself like what it represents is cuz it it seems to be a nothing of its own like it it just wants to spread yeah just it, take over shit yeah it does not matter to it is it's its primary motive is spreading so like mm-hmm. if if it has to use this guy's obsessive uh controlling love as its primary motivator if that works, whatever. It, it doesn't care. It, its only interest is in spreading. So, like, I, I try to think of, like, ways to associate that. Like, because so many horror creatures have, you know, some sort of real-world connection to a societal problem. And this desire to simply spread without any any central motivation except for domination uh seems to i mean you know you could say that that is about imperialism is about uh you know any number of things i i think in this case it it really is like the the virus itself is supposed or virus the parasite the the thing itself is supposed to be this uh, representation of Starla's fears that he is everywhere and she can't escape him. Mm, so yeah. it's, it's, you know, maybe you could find some bigger world thing that this is all supposed to represent, but I think this really is about Starla and her escaping abuse, her trying to eliminate this fear from her life that seems all encompassing and to pervade every element of her life. Well, that's fine. Mr. College boy with my education, (laughs) with your degrees and stuff like that. I know you're always (laughs) flying around. I'll tell you what I seen in this movie, Steve. I see this thing spread like a, you know what? Virus. I see people wearing masks over their face Uh to try to keep this virus from spreading. And I'll tell you what, did you notice there's that one shot early on in the movie whenever Nathan Fillion is at that bar? Did you notice what was on special and that chalkboard sign above his head? I did Corona. Not. What? Mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, this definitely Writing's does. on the wall, Steve. Writing's on this, the wall. This definitely does. Like, if, if from the beginning of the pandemic, they had just said, there are giant slugs that want to get in your mouth, and if you wear a mask, they can't. More people would have worn masks. Yeah. Because that's yeah. gross. Yeah, you don't want that. <laughs> Nobody wants that. Even if it was like, no, that's not real, it would be like, but man, if it is, like, I don't want that shit. So. I don't want none of that. No. I'm just going to wear the mask, because that's fucking gross. 
I think in addition to some of the themes that you talked about too, there is a little bit of a theme that I always think is is fascinating, which is evolutionarily humans are so young it's such an early species like fucking cockroaches yeah. are way older of a yeah, species than us and they're still that, here yeah and that that sort of uh you know like every single horror movie where they have a classroom setting they're setting up the theme of the movie and she's saying yeah. like survival of the fittest it's not necessarily about strongest or best it's about most adept uh, most adept to the the climate around them most adapted yeah. to the climate around them. God <laughs> damn it. There it is. Yep. <laughs> but that's always a, a theme that I think is really fascinating. We've seen that even explored in Jurassic Park and other movies too, where in the grand scheme of things, we ain't really been here all that long. There's other right. species that have dominated the earth for way, way longer spans than, than humans have. So, you know, it's like in this movie, mm. you've got this little small town of people and this batch of space slugs shows up and turns out to be far superior because honestly at the end of the movie they kind of win i mean we see obviously the main you know grant grant host gets blown up by clean burning american propane how king of the fucking hill is that which <laughs> i do love but at the very end like the the post credits kind of stinger there we see that the alien okay, is still alive yeah, yeah. and it affects that cat yeah so it's like well, it's, it kind of shows you that we're not really the top of the food chain all that much. Well, it's about survival of the fittest as well, meaning that the three people at the end are the most fit for survival in this like yeah. fantasy world. So what is that saying about us? Or what is it saying about the, these people? As I said, there's this connection between Ky Kylie and Starla. Like basically Kylie is the younger version of Starla and she still has this opportunity to escape. Uh, and then you, you've got Bill in the middle there as he, he survives well because he's smart enough to know he doesn't know, but he's also lucky enough that his failures never lead to a permanent, like, end. Like, he, yeah. his failures could have killed him so many times, but they just don't. So, oh, yeah. You, you said earlier while we were kind of plotting the episode out where it's like he's very much the anti-Tom Atkins. Yeah. Like yeah. he's the opposite of the, of the guy creeps, that's just Tom fucking... Tom Atkins is just the coolest. Everything yeah. works Joe out cool. for him. Like, yeah, and him uh, or uh, Bill, that's not the case. It, it's every one of his plans seems like that's a pretty solid plan and then never works out. That's one of the things I love about this movie, too, is that like way early on whenever the police are like arming up and stuff they make note of this hand grenade that they have in there uh -huh. that they and confiscated they off them kinda, fellas yeah, dynamite like fishing long shot that kind of you know reminds us it's there yeah and you're like okay that's definitely got to be the thing they use to like beat the big bad at the end of the movie like it's telegraphed a mile away and then when it finally gets to that point it's just like this fucking comedy of errors with them yeah. trying to handle this hand grenade. Like they yeah. keep fucking it up and then eventually it gets lost in a swimming pool and it blows up and it's so unsatisfactory. Yeah, like it's, it's like underwater. a teeny tiny. Right. Yeah, it's like it's so lame mm -hmm. that that is a joke that they set up way early in the movie. Yeah. That you think is a plot device? No, it's actually just a joke because well, it turns out so shitty. And the thing is that the movie is, and James Gunn is reminding us in this moment that Bill is not our antagonist. This is not yeah. about Bill. This is about Starla and her overcoming Grant. Yeah. She has to be the one to kill him. It can't be Bill. So, yeah, Bill's there. Uh, as like this sort of traditional i'm gonna save the day hero but he's not the badass i mean uh, we see starla stab that guy through the head with that that pole like she's the badass for sure yeah so survival of the fittest in the end is uh starla and kylie are the fittest they they seem to be really good at this and bill got lucky which is again exactly what darwin is survival of the fittest kind of was is is a lot of it's luck a lot yeah, of it is sure. just being the right thing at the right place at the right time and that's what bill is oh yeah and as they're fighting this horde of alien invaders you know we're treated to a lot of, of special effects as you would expect in a movie of this type and it's a pretty good mix of yeah. of practical and CG. There's quite a lot of the stuff that is practical, and then there's stuff that's obviously CG. Mm -hmm. I 
I personally think for a relatively cheap movie in 2006 that yeah. a lot of the CG stuff still holds up pretty Just fine. well. Yeah. It's fine. Like, yeah. I mean, you know, you're not going to kid yourself into saying, I bet that really happened. Like, no, you're <laughs> not. But no. at the same time, I think that they use CG pretty well in terms of like just using it for stuff that was in the dark or stuff that wasn't really all that feasible practical like that guy getting like cleft in twain out in that field and stuff <laughs> i love that i mean it doesn't look amazing but no it's still cool yeah but i do love the fact that they kept a lot of the like let's say monster shots of michael rooker and stuff right all practical and mm -hmm. just in these ridiculous crazy foam latex morph suits and shit yeah. like that i'm sure that had to take for fucking ever to yeah. apply the the very Brenda, thing -like. like gigantic full of slugs thing was a practical effect like they they tried to do as much practical as they could and i i love that a lot of the cg doesn't hold up but again yeah you're talking about a 15 million dollar movie in 2006 looks pretty good then I think there, so. There's some moments, though, like at the beginning with the whipper will that is CGI for some reason, and it just yeah. looks terrible. <laughs> yeah, like, dude, and it's like the first that? shot of the movie, and you're like, here's a fake bird, and it's like, oh, man, that's not Don't really setting that. a good tone. Yeah. I think the fact that the movie is also never playing itself dead seriously makes it yeah. easier to accept when some of the yes. effects are like kind of shot. I mean, it puts you in the same mindset of watching you know 1950s and 60s b movies right. where you see the fucking and that's what zipper on for. the back of the suit i mean yeah. it's like it's okay if you know that it's fake look exactly. at this thing yeah so yeah you're it's easy to suspend disbelief and not really care about the cgi because i honestly didn't i didn't really nah, think about it either. until it was like well we got to talk about it it's, yeah totally uh, it's it's good enough it, it, for the the feel and tone of the movie it really it's just fine and you're right for the budget and the time it's good i think so man but definitely the most fucking terrifying and real moments of the movie is for sure whenever grant grant goes to that karaoke bar and that lady's up <laughs> there lady singing sing the crying, crying game, game. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> dude yeah. that scene cracked me the fuck yeah up. that is hilarious it really is like just so many so many perfect moments that just kind of hit that hit that small town like feel of just like you you go to a bar if they have karaoke oh it's gonna be bad <laughs> there's gonna be the one person who can actually sing that gets up there and nails something and then the next person's like all right well here's me doing rapper's delight <laughs> oh my god man like i've been at that place i've yeah. totally been to that place before and seen that person singing that song uh, yes <laughs> absolutely fantastic there's some fun soundtrack stuff in this as well oh, yeah. uh, lots of air supply <laughs> yeah well uh this the music is by tyler bates who um we have to talk about because we are already kind of dissed on him in our, ty our uh, Tammy and the T-Rex episode because we were oh, talking about shit. how bad the music was. But that was one kinda of his... Kind of dunked on him a little bit. Kind of dumped on him, but uh, honestly, if you talk about any of his other movies, the Dawn of the Dead remake, uh, you know, uh, Guardians of the Galaxy, for instance, Devil's Rejects, you look at that, oh, those soundtracks, they're fucking I kind of knows how to pick solid. a tune, I'll tell you yeah. what, man. Yeah, so... Uh, you know, Tammy and the T-Rex was an early thing, and I'm sure his budget for music was tiny, so no need and to And at the same time, it. though, man, I mean, it still did kind of fit that movie. It still was pretty <laughs> fucking perfect, right? Is. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the guy knows exactly what he's doing. Again, DC, hire that guy. Yeah. He knows how to place movie, yeah, uh, music into your Suicide fucking movies. Yeah, because that Suicide Squad music choice was just like... Come on. It was like... Oh, uh, those are the bands that are popular. Just pick any random song. Any of them. Yeah. Just stick them in there. Whatever is, the most popular song, song the 70s? was. Throw it in there. Just go on every band and find the number one most played song on Spotify or YouTube. Put that in. Turn that shit up. Yeah. Oh, my God, man. Yeah, it's a really, really fun movie. And one of the things that I really enjoyed about it is the, the, the pacing of the movie and the length of the movie, I think, was 
exactly right. Like there's at no oh, point yeah. any dull spots in this. Like yeah, there's a few times where it's just like three days later, like little passages of time, but yeah. you never feel like this is taking way longer than it should to make this point made. Yeah. I think that the movie was very self-aware of what it was doing and what it was trying to say and the fact that it didn't need to be two and a half hours long like fucking Wonder Woman 1984, right. for example. Jeez. Yeah, it's a it's an hour 36 total with credits. Like, Yeah. That's solid. That's tight. That's exactly Flew what by you for want. me. You, me like, too. It really it's did. never boring. It's always like moving along. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, it's like you still feel like you get to know the characters and stuff like that well. Oh, yeah. So I don't feel like it was like too brisk where it was just like it's nothing but forward momentum and I'm not getting to know any of these characters. And I think a lot of that does fall back to the actors uh, that are that are in this because ultimately kind of the vibe that I got from this is this kind of feels like a B-movie trauma flick only with more money and yeah. better actors and, and less misogyny <laughs> yes yeah F- far fewer uh we're trying too hard to be not pc jokes yeah. yeah 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 exactly he's like nick that stuff out and you've kind of got this movie yeah you know it does have it does have i guess the un pc joke of margaret packs a box box lunch but <laughs> i'll be honest with you the the way that like James Gunn's captured uh what it's like for small town gay people pretty well because the fact is in a small town it's not like oh you're gay we're gonna beat you to death in the town square it's like oh you're gay well if you keep it at acceptable levels we'll just be derisive of you when we talk about you but we won't like yeah. kill you like <laughs> the way they treat her and then the the fact that they just kill her like she doesn't get infected with the thing she just gets acid uh, spit at her and dies that's true like the the rejection of her by the hive mind which again i'm associating with this small town like insular culture like the huh. fact that they don't even that, yeah. bring her in yeah, they don't assimilate yeah. it. It's just like, yeah, nuke or whatever. Like, I saw some criticisms huh. of that as like, oh, James Gunn wrote this lesbian character and then just killed her. And it's like, I think he's making a more particular point that, like, they would never invite her into the hive mind. That makes sense when you look at it that yeah. way. I hadn't really even considered that, honestly. Yeah. So, again, I think it just really well captures that small town uh, southern vibe. One of my favorite deaths in here is definitely the mayor who like <laughs> as soon as he's like just barely turned like, yeah, like I think maybe me. he's gone over. <laughs> yeah. yeah, like Nathan Fillion just fucking shoots him in the and head. He just it's shoots like him immediately. Over. Probably immediately. happy as fuck to do it cuz that yeah. dude's <laughs> That, that dude, dude is sucks. a dickhead. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that really cracked me up. There was like zero hesitation. It's like, oh, okay, do I get to kill him yet? Okay, good. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's yeah, so, so it, funny, man. I yeah, I think I think everything in this for me just hits. Like I, I think it's a, a really good movie. Like you know, it's it's hard to say it's not original, even though it's paying all this homage. Like it's still doing something unique with it. It's really like bringing something more to it while still keeping it funny and light. So it, yeah, I mean, you could see it as pulling a lot from these other movies, or you can see it as kind of perfecting all of what they were trying to say. True. And I think it is a kind of like, I mean, but again, night of the creeps kind of does that as well. So it, it's, I, I get that Night of the Creeps came 20 years before. Um, but this movie, I think, does... Because you go back and watch Night of the Creeps, like, a whole lot of that is, like, college kids trying to get laid. And yeah, sure. It, it just doesn't have... I mean, because, again, as I said, you can watch Slither and only see it as gore and fun or whatever, but it does have a heart to it. There is some, like, actual story at the center of it that that's... I, I think resonates more than college kids trying to get laid. So... For me, this is like a really solid movie that I, I cannot believe it's taken me this long to rewatch. 
Same, dude. I'm I'm thinking back at like all the Halloween seasons where I didn't watch this. Yeah. Or like have this on yeah, at a I party and I'm like, yeah. what is the matter with me? Like <laughs> this is one of those ones that now that I've watched it again, I know will become a staple where it's yeah. like, oh, I ha- I have to watch this about every year now because yeah. I really really do enjoy it. I enjoy how accurately southern it is dude name another movie that features a baby in a crib with a tomato that baby has a tomato <laughs> just a tomato no explanation either no. just a baby with a tomato yeah. uh, the explanation would be well he likes it he like his teeth hurting him yeah. so i just gave him an old tomato and it don't hurt his teeth none and he <laughs> likes it yeah dude and his and his mom's initials are bm which BM. is a joke yeah. holy shit <laughs> fucking hilarious yeah and and again just the pacing the humor everything about it really does hit with me very well you know maybe if you're the kind of person that just wants your horror just to be scary and dark and disgusting it's like maybe this this wouldn't really hit for you but most horror fans like real horror fans i know aren't like that like most of us have a dark sense of humor that appreciates stuff like this so to me this is one of those that i think really will appeal to a lot of people and will become a regular in in my rotation, man. Yeah. What kind of a what kind of a number would you attach to this thing on a scale of n to ten? Well, first of all, uh, shout out to Doctor G Virus who submitted this. Thank you. Oh yeah, uh, that's glad, right. Thank like, you. Uh, we picked this just from looking at the titles submitted and being like, oh, I'd like to do that one. Uh, I'm glad it was submitted. I, as you just said, had not thought to rewatch it, and I needed to. Uh, looking back on it and this is so solid to me yeah the cgi you know is a problem and isn't a problem we kind of explained that away as like yeah it's like seeing the the zipper on the monster watching a 1950s movie it's like well yeah you suspend your disbelief on that um but i wish it was all practical and i think that's probably too. exactly what james gunn would have wanted oh sure um i don't <laughs> i don't see a ton of other problems though i don't know uh even like even the rape scene i I mean and and a bunch of dogs and cats get killed in this like these are the types of things we say we hate to see in horror movies but this movie does them well like he the death of the dogs and stuff is like he's bad like these are bad things that are happening He's mm-hmm. doing this terrible thing to Brenda. These are all negative things, and the movie's not, like, reveling in them. So I think it does a really good job. I I mean, you know, it's it's not it's not the most revolutionary movie in the world. As we said, it's paying a ton of homage, but it's 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 something that I'm going to watch a lot more after this. So for me, this is like probably like an eight and a half to a nine. You read my hive mind, dude. That's yeah. exactly where I would put this as well. Like to me, I think yeah, eight and a half is probably exactly where yeah. I would put this. I'll, I'll watch it again. I'll laugh at it again. Yeah. I don't feel like it's one of those things that's only going to be funny to watch every ten years. I feel like this is one of those ones that's going to have those those lines, you know, where I'm like, hang on, you got to hear this part. This is hilarious. Yeah, yeah. That's my favorite kind of coke. That's the only kind of coke <laughs> I like. Like. Oh, shit like that is like. is so funny man <laughs> yeah. so yeah I, i'm right there with you i think eight and a half seems like a solid rating for this one Hell yeah. really 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 did enjoy it a lot i hope that one day we get to see uh gun return to horror like so yeah. many of these amazing directors whether it be peter jackson or gun mm-hmm. or Raimi, like all these cats start off in horror because it's cheap and they make money uh and a lot of them never come back to it. And that's such a bummer to me. So I hope that one day we get to see fucking Disney rich James Gunn take yeah. another swing at horror and do something oh, yeah. that is That'd be nice. ridiculous, you know? It, by the way, speaking of uh, culminating all the things that we've been saying, DC has so many great mystical and horror titles they could go into. Yeah, and I re- like I, I said about the New Mutants. I really want like uh, Brightburn, fucking awesome. It's a superhero horror movie. New Mutants was supposed to be superhero horror. I want superhero horror. Give me a, a Batman movie with Scarecrow and really make it scary. 
Oh yeah, go like, real dark. Fucking with it. go into it. We need more of that. Like that. that There's is some a... Batman villains too that that get super dark as fuck. Oh, you could expand on yeah. any number of those. Like they're not the super A list ones like the Joker and shit. But there is yeah. plenty of Batman villains you could pluck from. Absolutely, where shit could get really dark uh-huh. really fast. Yeah. And that's something that Marvel hasn't done. Yeah. So stick a flag in that shit, man. Do that shit. Yes. Try and stop trying to copy them and go your way because. The DC animated shit is the fucking best. That's what literally everybody has told me. It's the best. It started with Batman, the animated series. It moved through Justice League, uh, all sorts of other things, Static Shock, uh, Batman Beyond. It's been going on forever, and they've got so many solid, strong stories, and then they come to the movies, and they're like, I don't know, what's Marvel doing? Yeah, What's the fucking most obvious thing that we could do that yeah. maybe is kind of like what they're doing? Like, where where are these decisions being made? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It all comes brothers, full circle. Yeah. yeah. Fuck the DC <laughs> yeah. fucking cinematic universe, man. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, definitely a fun movie. I recommend checking it out, and I hope that we get to see more coming out of Mr. Gunn. And I hope that you guys get to see some more coming out of us whenever you tune into our next episode, yeah. which is a part of Fanuary. Steve, mm-hmm. tell me about Fanuary. Fanuary, we have decided all throughout January to just choose from our Patreon submissions from our $5 Patreon patrons. And we started with this wonderful movie, Slither, which we just chose on our own. Next week, we we had a poll from six movies, and we had people vote on it. Smoking poll. And Arachnophobia won that vote, Woo. so we're going to be covering Arachnophobia. I'm just looking forward to seeing old John Goodman, man. Me America's too. dad, yeah, I love Dan John Connor. Yeah, and looking I forward seen, to zooming on that one. This is another one I haven't seen since it came out, basically. So wow, yeah, that was ninety four, maybe ninety something like that. Yeah, yeah, really early nineties. I, I probably haven't seen it since like high school. Yeah. Like I, I really don't know the last time that I saw this, and I yeah. know it's just been one time. So I might as well be seeing this. For the first time. <laughs> Feels like the, the first, first time. time. We're singing. Take a shot. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I'm excited about that. Arachnophobia. Uh, but, yeah. but yeah, the rest of January, um, ne- ne- the week after that, we're going to cover a movie selected by one of our top fans, my wife. Uh, Ooh. And then the, the fourth week, we're just doing the traditional old random drawing. So it, you Good can still get in there. Get your your title in there and get selected. Over on patreon.com slash dead and lovely. That's right. That's where you can go to to give us your dollar papers and get a voice in how the show is run and get access to all the bonus Patreon yeah. only content that we've put up. There's all kinds of goodies on there for Yeah, we you. just recently did uh, the Guy Pierce Christmas Carol, which was fun. And yeah. Yeah, we got a got a bunch of fun stuff up there. So Head on over there. Become a patron at any level. You get free stuff. It's not free. You're paying for it. That's right. But <laughs> you get bonus stuff if you give us the money. So it's kind of like it's free. Basically, you know, okay. So it's like when you go into a store and you're like, yeah. you know what I want is an apple. And you I grab an apple. apple and you start to uh-huh. walk out and they're like, uh-uh-uh. Uh, 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 could we have some money for that? And you're like, uh, uh, what, uh, what is money? And they explain to you the entire concept of money. It takes a while. And you're yes, like, oh, yeah, I got some of that. Yeah. And you hand them the money. And then they're like, you can now have that apple. And you're like, free apple. It's like that. Kind of like I got it for free. Yeah. Apple free with exchange of dollar papers. <laughs> Makes sense to me. Yep. You know, it's pretty easy to see. So it's kind of <laughs> like our, our bonus Patreon episodes are kind of like that. So just go with that logic that we just put out there. It makes perfect sense, y'all. Duh. 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 And also be sure to follow us on the Instagrams and Twitters and yeah, all that yeah. other stuff. At Dead Lovely Pod on Twitter and Instagram, uh, Facebook.com forward slash Dead and Lovely. We've got a great Facebook group. Uh, we also have the Screaming Chat. It's an awesome time. We chat on the Discord. I post that Discord link uh, every single Friday. So it's up on all the social media. Yeah, that's right. So come on and hang out with your boys. Drop us some reviews. 
on Apple Podcasts and stuff. I, I need to see some good ones. I want to read some funny ones on the show. Mm-hmm. I want to make you famous. Mm-hmm. Be somebody, baby. Leave us a review. <laughs> what's funny and i will read that shit on the show we need more of them we need more reviews if you want to help us out and not spend a dime on us that's a great way to do it right yeah, there so that's true review the show wherever you can and we will appreciate that and we will be seeing you guys next time talking about old arachnophobia steve i don't like no spiders i'm kind of mm. scared to spiders i might have a little bit of that a little bit of that phobia myself so this is going to be a rough one for me i'm going to okay. be just a a shivering mess I remember as I watch this movie. It disgusting me. I like spiders don't bother me, but I'm not excited to see a spider. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Mm. Hey, good to see you, buddy. Oh, mm-hmm. nah, get you out don't here. talk. Not too many legs. Ooh, <laughs> too many legs. Ooh, that's what we say to them. Yeah. So be sure to tune in next week. We'll be talking about them creatures. What got too many legs? I hope everybody <laughs> had themselves. A safe and happy New Year's. I hope that 2021 is already amazing by the time that you're hearing this. I really, 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 really hope yeah, so. I hope that too. Also, um, you know, RIP Mitch McConnell. I hope. <laughs> <laughs> Did I just say that? What? I don't know. I'm in just taking Minecraft. a guess. Minecraft. Yeah, yeah, in Minecraft. Yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. In the artificial world. Right. <laughs> right. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. We've been Uncle Ben. Hollywood Steve. AKA Dead and Lovely. You guys have been fantastic. Catch you later. So this year on our Christmas Eve dinner, for a rare occasion, we enjoyed ourselves a baked potato. We don't often bake a potato around mm-hmm. our home, but I understand that. when you're having like a, a prime rib dinner, it just makes sense. It just makes sense, right. you know? And I always forget how much I enjoy a baked potato. But when I say I enjoy a baked potato, what I'm really saying is I enjoy eating butter and cheese. Yeah. 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 Like, the potato part itself is everybody's least favorite, right? Well, no. I mean, I, I never would have thought of it that way as my least favorite. But I guess in those three, yeah. I mean, but I would also have sour cream on there, so it would be number four. And yeah, I guess it's Just getting my lower least and lower down the list. favorite. Wow. But, mm-hmm. I mean, I'm not, ma- I'm, I'm not mad at a potato. <laughs> I just think that we should normalize eating the butter and the cheese without the potato vehicle, you know? I mean... It's keto, right? It is. And uh, you know what? You can do, and I, I recommend this, uh, you, you get yourself, uh, if you got a non-stick skillet or uh, a good cast iron, take a little butter, and you can just make little discs of cheese and make some little cheese crisps. Woo. That's keto as fuck, man. <laughs> Look out. Yeah. So there you have it, folks. Normalize eating cheese and butter. (laughs) This has been my TED Talk. (laughs)